Fed is doing the job. The market is very excited around policy rates peaking. The question is, is there even more to go? I think there is if the rally becomes broader. The next six months, we're expecting inflation to come down. We hopefully are getting to the point where the aftershocks of the pandemic in terms of the economy are now settling out. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Two-day winning streak on the S&P attempting to become three. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures on the S&P barely positive. A little bit later this morning, earnings from Goldman Sachs at around 7.30 Eastern time. After the bat, a little bit later, we pass the bat on from Wall Street to Silicon Valley. Netflix TK coming up after the close. Yeah, Netflix is interesting. It sneaks up here in the middle of bank earnings. Maybe it's the first of the tech. Uh, but I'd also mention it's a new Netflix and that there looks to be profit sustainability. And I bring this up because of a lot of what we're seeing around the world this morning, which is corporations adjust. Netflix adjusted about seven months ago, and the fruits of that labor is going to pay off this afternoon. Password sharing crackdown. Vanessa Friedman, right? You know, Gucci. I mean, you know, Gucci's adjusting. Gucci shake Keering, up too. Keering went in there with a massive shake up, and that's what you're going to see here. I mean, it's, it's shake up. It's shake up Wednesday. Let's sit on the banks just for a moment. Goldman come out a little bit later. We've said all week it's not just about the major players on Wall Street. BFA, Morgan Stanley. Yesterday, it's also about the regionals. Western Alliance, a name you heard a lot about over the last few months. Here's the good news: deposits are coming back. They're up. Here's the bad news, Lisa. Interest expenses up 25 percent from the previous quarter. It's getting more expensive to attract that capital. What's fascinating to me was the response in markets to that. It's getting more expensive. It's getting harder to be profitable, and yet the shares ripped. They are now at the highest level going back to March 8th, raising questions about how low the bar already has been set, first of all. And second of all, whether it's a get deposits at all costs so that you fade off some of those existential risks. Is that what we're talking about? Just in general, the banking index at the highest level overall going back to March 10th. I'm going to give you existential risk. How about this? The last 10 years, shareholder return per year. Morgan Stanley, Gorman, with that wonderful uh, Basic interview yesterday, up 15% per year, just below that, up 15%. For James Gorman, we'll round it up, up 15% per year. Goldman Sachs up 9% per year. That's the tension, the difference, as we go to 7.30 this morning. James Gorman thinks the worst might be over for investment banking, TK for trading. Maybe things yeah. get better from here. That was the message to Shanali in that interview yesterday afternoon. That's Shanali's skill set. I just am not up to speed on that. I don't look at the smooth guys. I don't know what they're doing, but I would say it seems like equity is surprised. Am I right? Across you calling all them the, banks? the smooth guys? Yeah, they hang out with Shanali. You know, they have a beverage. The smooth you know. guys. They, they have their martini shaken, not stirred. It's okay. different. You know, is that, it's, does it's, that make you smooth? I'm not smooth. No. <laughs> okay. God, no. Got no idea where this is going. Downside surprise on UK inflation. Let's sit on that for a second as well. This follows a downside surprise on US inflation last week. Just feels like, Tom, globally, just pulling back from those peak rate hiking cycle oh, fears yeah. going deeper into summer. I agree. There's a shift here. And you see in the UK, somebody, I'll give the journal credit, I can't remember who, had a nice chart. Maybe it was Bloomberg, of all the different disinflations out there. And the U.S. is at the best position of disinflation. And ugly United Kingdom actually is finally rotating around. And that's that good feeling that you've got. Let's see if we keep that good feeling through the summer. We need a few more prints like this one over the next several months. But certainly so far so good for the last month or so compared to where we were, that's for sure. Let's touch base with the market just quickly, briefly. Equity futures on the S&P 500 just about positive by 0.04%. That downside surprise in the UK sparking a rally in the global bond market. Gilt's doing nicely. Treasuries too. Yields are lower by a couple of basis points here, Lisa. Your 10-year, 3.76. As you were talking about bank earnings back in focus, the last of the large banks to report Goldman Sachs at about 7.30 a.m. Eastern. Then we also get m and Bank, Citizens Financial and Zions throughout the day. I am interested in the regionals, potentially even more than Goldman Sachs. Yes, Goldman Sachs is a fascinating story specifically to that firm with a question of what happens post Marcus. But in general, banks have climbed back to the highest levels of valuation going back to the start of the banking crisis in March. Can we climb further? Today, the other earnings, as you were mentioning, John, we are going to get Netflix and IBM after the bell, as well as Tesla and United Airlines. I'm also watching Carvana, which had a surprise announcement yesterday that they are going to move forward their earnings release from August 3rd to today before the, bar, before the bell. We don't know why, 
the markets are taking it as bad and those shares are, are steeply lower in pre-market trading. And at 8.30 a.m., we get U.S. building permits and housing starts. We saw a huge rebound in the last month's reading. We're expecting that to revert more to the norm. But this is the question. Do we get a housing rebound at a time when this was the one area people were pointing to as being most interest rate sensitive, John? That economic data, two hours and about 25 minutes away. The bulls out there at the moment. Here's the outlook. Jonathan Gollop over at Credit yes, Suisse. Yes, thank you. Was in and around 4K year rent on the S&P. Here's the price target now. 4700 on the S&P 500, which, let's face it, a couple of months ago sounded really, really bullish and now not okay. so much. TK, here's the quote. Our base case is that a recession will be averted, inflation will remain sticky near current levels and monetary policy yeah. will tighten only incrementally. UBS Gollop, Mr. Gollop, G-O-L-U-B. <laughs> You need a referral. Stop by here. Has he nailed it or what? Go back 18 months. He's just absolutely nailed it. Are we it. saying UBS scholar and not Credit Suisse scholar? Is that what we're doing I, now? I, no, I have no clue. Good morning, <laughs> He's John. Trying to pitch him. John's He's tuning in, I'm gig. sure. And, you know, if you need a word, John, you know, you know, I, I can probably they don't we'll want me to put get it in, in touch word. with John. Fantastic research to read. He's always. just nailed it. I mean, there's no other way to put it. Dan Morris joins us now, Chief Market Strategist at BNP Paribas Asset Management. Dan, do you agree with that, that the base case is that a recession is going to be averted, inflation might be sticky, but monetary policy will only tighten incrementally? Um, more or less. So the view of our macro research team is that we get a slowdown and, and not a recession. But I think at the same time, we want to not then overstate the case for risk assets. OK, certainly it's not a recession. That's better than, than uh, what we were fearing. But it's still got to be a trend of slowing economic growth. Uh, we're going to continue to get on the margin negative economic data over the next few months. So it's at best a modestly benign environment uh, for equities, but not something that for us signals a significant appreciation. And then when we add on top of that valuations, particularly in the U.S., particularly for tech, if anything, we're cautious, we're underweight developed market equities uh, on the concern about uh, the froth you could argue you have in the market right now. And Dan, the hallmark of BNP Paribas, really going back over to your outstanding China coverage, if you've actually nailed GDP back 15 years, a very great caution on the recovery out of the great financial crisis and, and all that. You're Greg Bottle doing great work and such. Do you link your economics into your investment outlook? How much do they dovetail into each other? Well, I think it's a very good point to make, particularly when we're talking about China. You think how much we arguably obsess about uh, Chinese GDP, and of course it matters. I mean, in the long run, if you do a chart of nominal GDP in equity markets, it's, it's going to be a high correlation. But on a you know, quarter to quarter, month to month basis, uh, there should be other things that are going to drive corporate profits. And I think when we look to China and we look at consensus earnings expectations, for Chinese stocks, whether China gets 5 percent uh, real growth this quarter or it's 4.75, uh, you know, I don't think that's going to be the key determining factor if those earnings come through. And if they do, the market should reflect that growth. So right now you're liking uh, some of the developing nations, some of the equities there, partly also because yeah. of the promise of Chinese stimulus on the heels of subpar growth, at least according to their targets. Yeah. You said you are underweight developed market equities because of the froth that you're seeing. Where is the froth? I think probably primarily concerned with, with U.S. tech stocks. So on one hand, if you look at earnings growth forecast for the NASDAQ over the next, well, into 24 and 25, you know, it's 16 to 19 percent, which is quite a bit above the long run average. Now we can talk about how, how viable those expectations are, but they're, they're certainly quite bullish. And then on those already arguably high earnings forecasts, you've got another high P.E. And if you think that E actually should be a bit lower, your P.E. is even higher. So, you know, it's not like we don't like the case in the long run for U.S. growth stocks. But right now, you know, there has been quite a run up. And we think that's vulnerable to a correction, particularly if the Fed doesn't come through and cut rates as quickly as the market expects because it's that real rate, it's that discount rate that really hits those valuations. The distinction bet between what you're saying and what a lot of guests on this show say is that you see a correction in those shares. Other people come on and they say, you just might not see the appreciation. So broaden out, it's time to really get into some of the other sectors, which we've been seeing over the past couple of weeks. How come you draw this distinction that it doesn't necessarily mean it's time to go into some of the less, less loved sectors, whether it's banking or oil, uh, or consumer discretionary, but rather that big tech itself is going to lead a leg lower in the overall index. 
Well, for us, it's all about relative opportunity. So it's not to say that in the other parts of the market you couldn't see further appreciation. We'd all like to see better balance, certainly in the U.S. market between tech and the rest of the market. Uh, but hence, our overweight to EM Asia and to China is that, you know, again, on a relative basis, if we look at what those earnings expectations are, the multiple that's being put on those earnings, we just see more upside potential there as opposed to being an absolute call that you're not going to see some appreciation in other parts of the market. Dan, the quality issue goes back to international stocks. It's something we really haven't addressed here recently. With all of these dynamics, how do you set up for a year out, two years out, three years out with quality international, including European equities? Well, for Europe, I think the challenge has got to be we're already seeing you know, a more uh, rapid growth slowdown uh, than we're seeing in the U.S. And if you kind of go back to what people expected at the beginning of the year, it was that both the U.S. and Europe would slow down appreciably. You're starting to see that arguably more in Europe and the U.S. And I think that probably goes back to much more substantial stimulus you've had in the U.S. over the last couple of years with the fiscal stimulus at the beginning of the Biden administration, Inflation Reduction Act, and so on. So even at the long run, that's not supposed to work. It's certainly boosting U.S. growth now, whereas you see Europe at a minimum reverting to trend. Uh, and with the most recent core inflation data that we got out of the eurozone, you know, core inflation is still well above the ECB's target. And so probably needing to see, if anything, even a further growth slowdown to get that back in line. And that doesn't argue for a lot of upside potential for European equities. Is that a reason to buy the bond market or sell it? There's quite a move this morning, Dan, in fixed income in Europe. Let's wrap it up. Gilt yields are down something like 20 basis points right the way through the curve, down almost 30 at the very front end. Is that bond market a buy or a sell? Well, unfortunately, we did go long both uh, gilts and treasuries uh, a couple of weeks ago, so have been enjoying the rally that we've had in yields. You know, perhaps getting to the point we, where we start evaluating that long, but that's where we've been, uh, have been positioned, and so far that's working well. It's working very well. Congratulations on that call, Dan. Not too bad over the last couple of weeks. Dan Morris of BNP Paribas. There's your move. We're down something like 30 basis points on a two-year this morning in the UK to 476. On a 10-year, down something like 20 basis points to just north of 4.1%. There was a sneaky suspicion that maybe the Bank of England might have to go again, 50 basis points. But this morning, the economic data in the UK, perhaps changing the conversation just a little bit, TK. A little bit of a downside surprise on CPI, the right kind of downside the, surprise, the right kind of surprise in the UK. I mean, it's, it's what the Governor Bailey needs. I mean, it's the first little move here. And you know, my basic, my, my, I mean, John, you're the pro at this. You've lived it. I would suggest core inflation there is stickier than here, I would guess. And it'll be interesting to see. But are, are we correct that real estate inflation filters into the United Kingdom economy much quicker than here? I would say the, housing data the transmission yeah. from monetary policy in the UK yeah. into the mortgage Warwick market education. is much more transmission is, the is, word I is much more find. direct TK it's very true given the nature of the mortgage market in the can UK I, compared to this one in the US can I mention a symbol for East Coast Wall Street please do M&T Bank this is the old Marine Midland out of Buffalo this is the wonderful Mr. Willens uh, mourned and missed each day and this is a team that picked up the pieces off the death of Robert William Will, Willens and they are considered one of the definitive small bank operations in America, and they're by no means a small bank. And it's amazing here to see them do 3 4% per year for the last 10 years. And, and John, this is, Lisa, this is one of the good banks. This is what, what's so distressing here for me is this is the bank that's put up in business school is this is how you well, run a bank, and they're barely getting it done. So if you're just joining, M&T did just report earnings, which is the reason why we're, we're hearing about M&T. And they beat expectations and earnings per share. But this really is the key. They beat on deposits. And here, to me, is the theme. How much do we see deposits at any cost is going to be rewarded at the regional banks? Yeah. Because, again, it staves off some of the bigger existential risks. Better news compared to where we were three months ago, but it's costing them. That's for sure. Equity is just about positive from New York City. Good morning. It's obviously welcome news that inflation has fallen uh, and it shows that if the government and the Bank of England are prepared to take difficult decisions, 
we can win the battle against inflation. But nonetheless, for families up and down the country, prices are still rising much too fast. There's a long way to go. There's a long way to go. That was Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor of the Exchequer in the United Kingdom, following economic data out of the UK. A downside surprise coming in softer month over month. CPI at 0.1%. The median estimate in our survey was 04 the previous number was 0.7, so that's significant improvement month over month. Core year over year with a six handle was looking at seven and now at six. So an improvement here. And what you see off the back of this is a big rally of the bond market in the UK as people start to pair back bets about what you can expect from the Bank of England over the next several meetings. Who knows if that changes a month from now, but certainly so far so good over the last couple of weeks on the inflation front. So this is what the market looks like off the back of it. A rally in the gilt market, a rally in treasuries, yields are down by about three basis points on a 10-year 375. That's the economic data. Lisa mentioned some housing data coming out in America a little bit later this morning. Look out for that. And look out for this. In about an hour from now, we'll hear from Goldman Sachs. Then the attention shifts from Wall Street over to Silicon Valley, Netflix after the close. I think we hear from Tesla as well. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500, positive by 0.04%. TK, just a little bit of a lift, the nudge, a grind higher over the last few sessions. It's a grind higher. And Goldman Sachs, we can talk about up, down, and sideways. I think it's going to be a big deal. I think it's underrated. But I'm going to note oil oil back to 80 here. Brent crude back to 80 is not a small matter uh, for me, and maybe it shows a little better tone on global demand. Edmore City said 90's the ceiling on this yeah. program yesterday. 90's going to be the ceiling for him. And what was great about him was the geopolitics of it, that it's not just about microeconomics and supply demand and all that. There's some real movable parts here, and it, it leads to the optimism that we see out there. We're going to digress right now to the pessimism of your belief in the American political system. Expert on this is Wendy Schiller at Brown University. Her text is definitive on an introduction to civics. Wendy, I got an email from a lad up north in England, I think up in the mountains of Scotland, who said to me, exactly how dumb are politicians in America today? I'm reading Rick Atkinson's first volume of World War II, of Roosevelt, Marshall, a very young Dwight David Eisenhower and such. And the intellectual caliber there is just shocking. How dumb are our politicians today? How uninformed are they of the world of Schiller? Well, uh, the, I'm going to give you a statistic, which is that I think 99 percent of all members of Congress, the House and Senate, have a college degree, a four-year college degree. So being a college professor, I don't want to say they didn't learn anything in college, but at least the people who are elected to our federal Congress are, quote-unquote, well-educated. So um, I think the issue is international focus, the idea that yeah. the bad things that happen in the rest of the world, particularly in the erosion of democracy, won't affect the United States. So put our head in the sand, you know, go back to just th thinking about us, and then these things will not affect not only our political system, but our economic system. And that's the mistake, right? That's the sort right. of nearsightedness that we really have to worry about. That's exactly where I wanted to go. And I'm thinking here, folks, of 1942, we're going across Africa, and the British are saying the Americans really aren't in this war because we were isolationist, we were distant, we had the luxury of the two oceans before Pearl Harbor. Okay, great. How isolationist are we right now? But technically, actually, we're not isolationist, right? So we are actively supporting Ukraine. We're giving Ukraine now. We've already done, given them weapons that, you know, the United Nations and other world organizations say you shouldn't give to anybody, cluster bombs. We're very involved in supporting Ukraine. Uh, we have troops all over the world. We are now watching things that are happening, like in Israel, with the erosion of the judiciary, and thinking, uh-oh, here's our democratic partner in the Middle East, and how do we justify support for this country if they start to go much more authoritarian? Um, we're actually quite involved all over the world, but the politics of the United States mean that we don't really talk about it, um, that Biden doesn't talk about it enough. He has a meeting, obviously, this, this week with the Israeli president, but nonetheless, it's not politically sellable. In other words, it's not attractive to voters, particularly when voters are worried about inflation and the economy. And especially when voters are worried about January 6th and prosecutions of the former President Trump and questions about deep state and questions about political warfare that gets entrenched in the social fabric of this nation. Wendy, how much of a distraction is that? What's your takeaway from the last 24 hours of legal news and the former president's response? Well, the information about the potential charges doesn't say to me anything about sedition uh, or treason. 
And those are the things that would keep Donald Trump from being president of the United States. Other charges might actually put him in jail, but we don't really know if that means that he can't actually also serve as president of the United States from jail. I mean, literally, we don't know that. So those charges that are coming down do not look to be the most serious charges that would preclude him from taking office if he won the election. So I, I think Americans are now looking at the idea of recession. Maybe it's not going to happen. Maybe gas prices are a little bit less. Maybe inflation's coming down. We're looking at inflation coming down. They're looking about the day-to-day -day and the economy, and they're not yet really focused on 2024. Uh, it's the Republican Party that really has to manage the drip-drip of all these very serious investigations that could lead to convictions. And what do you do? If your rule of law justice system convicts former President Trump and he has to go to jail, do the Republicans completely reject our rule of law in that way? That is a very big and probably existential question for the Republicans right now. Wendy, you talked about how most people are focused on what the prices are and how much they're changing at the grocery store and whether or not we're going to go into recession, not necessarily the noise in the political theater behind some of the discussion, the rhetoric around the former president. Are you saying that the media is making more of this than the population is with respect to what the response is to it? Or do you think that there is a resonance, particularly among people who have followed the former president, and that this actually galvanizes them in a more meaningful and politically relevant way. Well, Lisa, this is the sort of big problem for political observers and campaign people, is that the summer before the year of the election, people aren't really paying attention. It doesn't mean that they're not hearing about it and absorbing it, but it's not a priority for them. And, and the galvanization may happen, but, you know, Trump has a ceiling in the Republican Party. In 2016, he won about 34 percent of the entire voting population of the primary voters. So it's not as if he's got the majority of the Republican Party lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, and that's the problem. The problem is that these charges just focus our attention on Trump, and they don't give any airtime for DeSantis or Asa Hutchinson or Chris Christie or anybody else who's trying to make their way. And that's the big problem for the Republican Party, is that even if you could get a little bit of traction, the attention given to these charges really soaks up all the oxygen in the media world. They'll get a chance next month, August 23rd, on the debate stage. How do you think this is going to play out on the debate stage for the Republicans next month? We don't know if Donald Trump will participate in the debates. You know, if I'm Donald Trump, I don't get on that debate stage because for the first time, I'll be the target of all the criticism. And even though it's been slightly muted on the campaign trail, on the debate stage, there will be people, if Chris Christie makes the debate, that go straight after Trump. So it's not an advantage to Trump. He doesn't need the visibility. He doesn't really need that to get his core base out the door. So I'm not sure why he participates except for ego, that he doesn't want there to be a media event with everybody else and not him. But nonetheless, I don't think it's a good strategy for him. So he may not show up. If he doesn't show up, we have to ask ourselves how many people will watch these debates, again, not giving these other candidates the opportunity to get their name out there among Republican voters, but also the, the voting general public, the, the general voting public at large. Hey, Wendy, thank you. Wendy Schiller there of Brown University. Just about a month away from that first debate <clears throat> for the Republican primaries, a month away, August 23rd, hosted by Fox News. TK, that is not the first time I've heard that characterization of what the former president should or shouldn't do. A lot of people would say, why take the stage? At the same time, they're thinking, well, maybe uh, ego know. will take him to the I stage know. in we, a month from now. We have gone so far beyond knowing whatever anybody's politics. It's absolutely original. And I, I go to the cumulative nature of this, like what is next after whatever happened yesterday. I believe it's Georgia, but uh, it, it, it's to be kind original, to say the least. Governor Christie up. coming up a little bit later. That's an interview to watch. Yeah. Banners of Power. 5 p.m. Eastern Time, Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio. The former New Jersey governor, Chris Christie, sitting down with a team, Joe Matthew and Anne-Marie. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. Sixty minutes from now, earnings from Goldman Sachs to wrap up the big banks on Wall Street. We'll get to that in just a, a little bit of a moment. Let's get to the bond market and equities too and start with stocks. Equities right now on the S&P 500. Futures just about positive on the S&P, closing out yesterday at the highest level since April of last year. On the Nasdaq up by 0.1%, closing out yesterday on the Nasdaq 100. For gains we haven't seen, Tom, since uh, 2020. Just a massive year in 2020. I... If you think about the returns 2020, huge year, 48%. Think about the gains so far year to date here, 45%. That's how big this year has been. 
just massively unexpected. The highest since wow. January 2022. Just uh, amazing. Know, we're we're going to pivot off this. And the, to me, the conversation isn't the silliness of the media right now looking at six months up or eight months up, October up or that, or the round trip down we went, ugly, up we went, we've broken even. I would go back pre-pandemic, and I haven't done the work, frankly. I'll do it here. How have the indices done from December of 2019? To me, that's of more interest uh, than anything else. Let's turn to the bond market just briefly. Guilt rallying really hard. Yields lower in the UK by something like 20 basis points from the two-year out to the 10-year. In the Treasury market, rallying in sympathy. We're down about three basis points on a 10-year, down four on twos to 472. Downside surprise on UK inflation as sparks a rally in the global bond market following a downside surprise on US inflation last week. Push it through the FX market, dollar weakness, dollar weakness and then some dollar strength. Euro dollar, 112.23. But the one to watch this morning is sterling. Sterling weakness, 129.33. What do you make? Is it a tangible move or is it just off the effervescence of 131? It's a move 0.8%. Ultimately, yeah. we're thinking about another 50 at the Bank of England, weren't we? We were thinking maybe you go six and perhaps Bramo at a 650 and some on Threadneedle Street. I think we've paired those bets after that move this morning. Don't you think it's strange that sterling is fading, is actually weakening, given the fact that perhaps <clears throat> you could get the Bank of England not having to raise rates as punitively into weakness? I mean, isn't it a strange move that suddenly the economic profile is less important than the rate hiking well, that's trajectory the ambiguity of, of central you're, banks? You're dead on, and that's the e economic ambiguity of it. And the answer here, John, help me here, the UK is surprised with a lack of recession, with economic growth Upside surprise, during this sure. inflation panic. Just like the UK. Yeah. Just like the UK. I would say this was about rate differentials more recently. It's been different. Difficult. I agree with you. If you think about where we were last year at the end of September, the Bank of England was needed to be aggressive. But I think there was a financial stability aspect to that or financial instability aspect to that. Good point. There was also the fiscal policy risk around it, too. So there was lots of different variables. But certainly over the last few weeks, you've seen sterling strength off the back of a more aggressive Bank of England. And we're fading it for the complete opposite reasons, I guess. For American audience right now, a clinic on the United Kingdom and on Europe and on their potential for economic uh, growth. Joining us now is Callum Pickering. He's with Berenberg, their senior economist. And Callum, the metaphor I want to do is your Sheffield United Blades... And years ago, like a decade ago, they ended up buying the Chengdu China football team. I mean, there's an export from the United Kingdom of capital over to China, I guess, to support global football. How is within Brexit this, this new Pax Britannica doing? How is the trade dynamic, given all the buffeting inflation in that, how is the UK doing on addressing China, on addressing world trade? It's, it's a good question. I mean, there's been a huge change in the distribution of um, trade for the UK. So we've shifted away a little bit from the EU, more towards non-EU trade. But it's not a huge move yet. These are generally things that happen over time. And actually, to a large extent, the uh, higher cost of trade through, well, trade barriers, uh, and of course, the, the, the weaker sterling hasn't shifted things between the UK and the EU quite so much as one might have expected. And as a result, you then haven't had the um, other side of the, the trade shift, which is non-EU. Well, where we've seen a big hit, actually, is on investment uh, in the case of the UK. But what are we going to see here? I mean, is Berenberg an optimist here on a Brexit United Kingdom coming out of this inflation, coming out of this pandemic, frankly, the tangential war in Ukraine? I mean, can you be a trade optimist on the United Kingdom? You can make a positive case for the UK, no, no question. This is a lightly regulated, open, advanced economy um, where I think you need to add a little bit of nuance is around what economic strength actually means. The UK is no longer a fast-growing, advanced economy because of Brexit, but for a host of reasons, potential growth has slowed decidedly. It's probably around 1.5% now. Before the financial crisis, it was probably 2.5%. However, even though potential growth has slowed, on the balance sheet side of the economy, from bank capital, household savings, the distribution of debt, consumer credit, you can make the same case for businesses. Debt is low, cash is high. The balance sheet of the economy is incredibly strong. And so when it comes to worrying about downside risks, we have to worry much less about that. The UK has gone from a highly geared, fast-growing, advanced economy to 
an economy with a good balance sheet that no longer grows so quickly. And so it's just much less exciting both ways. We avoided a recession over last winter, despite the pessimism around one. But looking ahead, the recovery will probably be restrained. We aren't going to take off as soon as these headwinds disappear. Everyone cares very much what's going on in the UK today because, as John has been mentioning, it's dominating the bond market after reporting that CPI in the nation dropped to 7.9 percent from the earlier read on a year-over-year basis of 8.7 percent. How similar is the disinflation in the United Kingdom to what we're seeing over in the U.S.? Um, it's almost the same mechanic with a lag of probably around six months for two reasons. First, there's a technical aspect around how energy price prices pass through the UK. In addition, UK labour markets, which are very, very tight, seem to have produced um, a higher wage response. Now, this is the thing that has the market a little bit worried. I think it's unjustified. I think what you have in the case of the UK is exceptionally tight labour markets, which have allowed workers, in part, to defend this real income shock. And the thing that I'm most focused on is inflation expectations for consumers. Forget about the break-even in markets. Look at consumer surveys. Inflation expectations have come down a lot, almost to normal levels. That tells me households, workers, are bargaining their wages up because of past inflation, not because of future inflation expectations. And therefore, as inflation falls because of the sources of inflation start to ease, that's energy, it's too easy monetary and fiscal policy in 2021, what you'll find is wages start to come down. So I don't see any evidence yet that this wage price spiral is forming. And the good news today is that it will help the Bank of England pause with rates a little bit earlier than the market wanted, which will allow the UK to avoid a hard landing. To take this a step further, Robin Brooks of the IIF pointed out that really all we're seeing with this inflation is the post-COVID normalization. This has nothing to do with tightening monetary policy, which he says has not made its way through the financial system yet in any kind of meaningful uh, way. Do you agree with that? And if so, what does that mean for when some of the rate hikes do take effect? Well, that's actually part, part of the argument that the Bank of England needs to stop soon. Best guess would be about half of the tightening done so far has actually passed through into the real economy. So the other half is to come. And we're already seeing a big disinflationary fundamental emerge in the case of the UK. So if the Bank of England just stopped now, which it won't, but if it did, there's still more tightening to come. Um, I don't I wouldn't be in the camp that said this is just all to do with the post-pandemic uh, unwind. Uh, there is definitely an element of monetary policy in there. And where you see that, for instance, is in is in housing markets and in real assets, which have turned down. You get the, uh, the negative impact on economic activity directly because there's less housing activity, but also on consumer demand as a result of things like net wealth, wealth effects. So if you, if you look hard enough, you can spot the monetary effects. Caleb, is this a recovery out of the pandemic in Europe and in your United Kingdom of the elite? Is this a recovery where we're leaving half the population behind? Um, it's certainly true that the the best in class parts of, of, of economies always do well first. So London, Southeast, Paris region. But curiously enough, what we haven't seen in Europe is a big gap, say, between Northwest European economies, so the, the big three, France, Germany, UK, throw in Benelux in there, and peripheral Europe, which is typically left behind. Mm -hmm. Actually, compared to the pre-pandemic level of GDP, Italy is above the UK, France, and Germany. So you don't right. get that between North and South anymore. That's a curious development. An unfair question, but you're so good at this, I'm going to go there. What is the, the best euro value for Germany right now? Slow down in manufacturing, hugely dominant. We all know the story. What euro level does Germany desire? Actually, it doesn't really matter for Germany. And I, I know this is a non-consensus view, but the quality of German products mean basically demand is quite inelastic and they're so specialized in many ways there's not much competition for the products that are made which means if the world is doing well you want expensive german quality manufacturing products that pushes the euro up so in normal times a strong euro is probably a signal actually that there's decent demand for uh, products out of these manufacturing oriented economies 
on the downside, when the euro is weak, yes, it may provide a little bit of relief, but ask why the euro is weak. It's generally because the world is not in good shape. And so I'd rather have the strong euro and the minor headwind than the weak euro and the big headwind. Hey, Callum, thank you. Callum Pickering there of Berenberg is... on the latest economic data out of the UK and worldwide for that matter. Here's the latest news coming from Carvana. Online platform, Tom, to buy used cars. I'm sure you've had a look there. I know you were going to ask, <laughs> what on earth is Carvana? I knew it. I know. Two pieces of news here. The earnings is one, but there's a debt restructuring here as well. So let's talk about the debt restructuring, extending maturities and coming to some kind of pact with several firms, including PIMCO and Apollo. The pact cuts over 83% of 25 and 27 note maturities and cuts interest expenses by more than $430 million a year for the next two years, apparently, according to the latest information. Carvana up in the pre-market by close to 7%. If you want the earnings, second quarter loss per share, 55 cents. The estimate was 112. So a little bit better there as well, Lisa, on that front too. Carvana was a darling of the pandemic. And then it absolutely got decimated with this question around used cars and whether they were going to have the same kind of traction. And now all of a sudden they're reporting that they are creating some actual cash flow, albeit still a loss, but they have a pathway to profitability. To me, the interesting thing was they pulled forward these earnings from August 3rd. They made the surprise announcement yesterday, perhaps because they got this packed together with the debt holders. And everyone assumed the worst and the shares tanked. And now people are rethinking that. Restructuring the debt, TK, extended maturities. Well, you get 83% debt. You look at the weighted average cost of capital screen on the Bloomberg. WACC, for those keeping score at home. And, and I, I just, is Lisa, you absolutely nailed. And, and of course, this is something I'm not so about. What's the profit proposition? You know, on the back of an envelope, on the back of a cocktail napkin at a bar, what's the profit proposition of something like Carvana other than moving deck chairs in financial engineering? Well, so I, I just don't get it. They're an online based used car yeah, sales I, uh, platform, and they offer to come and get your car and buy your car okay, great, and deliver that's concept, it to you. But my, and part of the issue is that other car companies and dealerships do this as well. They are online and they will offer the same services. So to your point, there was a chunk of time where people were saying, where do they distinguish themselves? And now they're cutting their debt and trying to create a new platform, which is the reason why you're seeing such massive fluctuations with anything that's positive, creating a massive pop in the shares. Let's get a five-year chart on the screen and we'll talk about that massive pop on the shares. <laughs> just, you know what this chart looks I like. I know exactly where we're is going with this. Pandemic darling. TK, look at this. <laughs> nice. Look at this. I mean, come on. We're down by something like, what have we got 89 percent of after yesterday's close based on where we were back in dumb, 2021 that's, that's why I said i'm uninformed a, dumb <laughs> question is this a meme stock it was it was a people meme were stock. saying but how much are we seeing increasingly the bar is just so low and the share prices are just so low that any positive news will create a very big percentage pop at least right now we're seeing a 20 percent pop which you'll say it doesn't really matter when you're coming off a base of one sure. but you know that's the kind of response we're getting it would be unfair to characterize this morning's move as a meme stock move though tom i wouldn't right. go that okay. far i mean this Fair. is a real restructuring with real players Man City's playing Sheffield United in late August. I mean, that's got to be Joe Elliott's going to go show up. Make a flight over and watch. Callum that. Pickering, Def Leppard together. And that had to do with Carvana. Is, is Callum going to get us tickets? Ca this is all he wanted to talk about. He's talking to Joe to drive Carvana you know, Car over to the Car show. Carvana just got in the way. <laughs> it's a Dow component. Carvana just got in the way. 100%. I think the investors sensibly look past um, what's been going on in the market recently. Deals will get done, companies will go public, people will trade. So I think the market sensibly looked at the big picture items and said, yeah, the rest of the stuff will just come and that's why we're trading the way we're trading. It was a great clean quarter. Things are going to get better for the investment bank. James Gorman, Morgan Stanley Chairman, CEO, in conversation with Shanali Basak yesterday afternoon. A little bit later this morning, in about 44 minutes from now, earnings from Goldman Sachs. Shanali will break that down for you. Let's break down the price action this morning. Equities drift in a little bit higher on the S&P 500 by 0.03%. Emphasis, of course, on 
a little bit. In the bond market, yields are lower. Treasuries rallying again. We're down three basis points on a 10-year, 375.41. Downside surprise on inflation in the UK, sparking a big rally in the gilt market. Your 10-year gilt down 18 basis points. Your two-year down 26. Off the back of that, a bit of dollar strength against some sterling weakness, 129.26 on cable. On the euro against the dollar, 112.19. We're negative there by 0.1%. We snapped that winning streak on a euro in yesterday's session. I want to get to Western Alliance. Here's a name we talked about a ton over the last three months. Western Alliance out with numbers yesterday afternoon. The stock's down about 2%. The good news, deposits are coming back. The bad news, it's costing them big time. Interest expenses up 25% from the first quarter. So, TK, you can attract the money. you just got to pay up for it. We have to see on that. Let's get right to it. We had Thomas Bouchard with us the other day of Keith Briette and Woods, a Stiefel company. And the Keith Briette Index is what people like Herman Chan watch. He's senior analyst for U.S. regional banks at Bloomberg Intelligence. He has been the foundation of Bloomberg surveillance bank analysts analysis, I should say, uh, since I think it was March, whatever it was, St. Patrick's Day, where the world uh, blew up. What did you learn yesterday from Western Alliance? So what we saw was. Uh, return to a bit more normal circumstances. Deposits are coming back, which is great and actually better than, than analysts had expected. Uh, but they are paying up for deposits. Uh, the good news is that they're they're actually reducing uh, some higher cost uh, wholesale borrowings as well. So you could see margin expansion going forward in the back half of this year. Um, loan growth is pretty solid and you're seeing capital increase as well. So it, it, they are taking tangible steps to return to a bit more normal pattern. And then interest margins getting crushed? It, well, it, it, it did disappoint a bit because of, of some higher cost deposits, as you mentioned earlier. But it, the expectation is that the margin should expand a bit going forward. We were wondering about their ability or mm -hmm. inability to finance the economy, not just them, but mm -hmm. a whole bunch of regional banks. You mentioned loan growth. Can mm -hmm. you just walk us through what it looks like across all the regionals right now? Right. We understand deposits and that profile mm -hmm. of things is better. Mm -hmm. We also understand they've got to pay up to do that. What right. about lending? Have they pulled back? It's been a bit tepid. I, I would agree with you. Uh, things are are a bit soft, both on the demand side and the and credit availability. Uh, the banks have talked about uh, pulling back in certain areas. You know, Citizens have talked about getting out of auto lending. Comerica, another regional that I cover, talked about getting out of lending to mortgage companies. So they're pulling back on the margins. And, and also they've talked about um, commercial borrowers, the business borrowers. They're a bit more cautious going forward as well. So it, there is a, both a uh, you know, suppression of both the supply side and demand side. So what's the business case going forward mm -hmm. for how they're going to get an edge, especially versus the behemoths right. that are firing in all cylinders and delivering massive returns? Right. So that that's uh, a good question. Uh, what we're seeing now is that the regionals are playing in a bit more defensive mindset. So pulling back on... on uh, on lending, shoring up their capital base, uh, trying to support their deposits. Uh, so it, it's going to be a bit of a tough slog because you're, you're seeing tougher capital requirements, tougher liquidity requirements, struggles on the top line. So it, it, it's going to take a bit of a time to, to get through this current phase. As we were talking about earlier, this idea that they are getting deposits, but they're having to pay up for them. Citizens Financial did come out. Those shares lower about 2% in pre-market trading after basically having the same thing. U.S. Bancorp just mm -hmm. coming out, net interest margin basically in line, a little light, mm -hmm. but total average deposits slightly under the estimate of $500 billion, mm -hmm. a 497. At what point won't it be worth it to keep paying up for deposits just to prove that they're not failing? Right. So at, at this point, I think you can see across the industry that deposits ha have been pretty stable uh, for the regionals. Um, one of the reasons why you may see some solar deposit growth going forward is that the banks are pulling back on lending. So uh, there's a higher bar for, for profitable lending going forward, given the fact that the marginal cost of deposits is, you know, almost 5% at this point, right? So being able to to deliver profitable growth is, is a struggle. And, and so that's why you're right. seeing a bit of a pullback. God, you're negative. You know, Herman, I'm, I'm, I'm looking here at, at, at what the tone that you're giving us. Mm -hmm. And there's only two ways to cut this. And the major question is, will a given bank mm -hmm. be a smaller bank in the future? And the other side is, when, in God's name, are these people put out of their misery? Keith Briett and Woods, 30-year total return under 7% per year. That right. is mediocrity 
defined. Right. When do they merge themselves out of pain, or does everybody just become teens weens compared to J.P. Morgan? Yeah, I, I, you would expect to see some merger and consolidation over time. It's going to be uh, – there, there are a few factors that are involved, right? Because, uh, number one, uh, the regulators and the Biden administration have been a bit more cautious on, on – bank tie-ups um, over the past couple years. They would block two itty-bitty, you know, relatively mm. itty-bitty banks from merging right now. It seems like the tone has eased a bit, um, given the fact of what happened in March and April, uh, but it still remains to be seen. Uh, the, the second issue is that uh, there, there's a bit of a, of a balance sheet issue because of the way rates have risen, and you have to mark the market the balance sheet. So that can create some hits as well. That's really, explain that. That, that's really important here. Right. Everybody's got fiction on their balance sheet now because it's priced down, yield up. That's not pretty. But if you mate, then you've got to show that loss. Right. So you mark to market the balance sheet of your target. So that could create a, a, a tangible book value ah, hit. White Fried Sandy. I Figured it out. Surveillance. Eh? Pretty good. You say sounds One negative. One third of our audience he, just turned He off. covers the regionals. Is he meant to sound positive? I, I don't get it. I, I mentioned this to Thomas Show the other day. I had Bank X. I didn't mention who it was. I have no idea why they're in business other than for the executives to go to lunch. That's negative. I, no idea. You said I, he sounded negative. Seriously. <laughs> yeah, he sounds negative. What do you sound like? I'm just a font of joy. Armageddon. <laughs> I mean, it seems to me they've got the political support mm -hmm. to stay in business as well. Right. There seems to be a massive effort mm -hmm. to make sure that we maintain these regional banks. Right. What do you think the regulatory backdrop is going to look like in the years to come? Right. Um, so it's going to be tougher. Uh, we've, we've heard from uh, the Federal Reserve and Michael Barr in terms of a, a blueprint for higher capital requirements. There's going to be more down the road as well, because he, he alluded to tougher liquidity requirements and other areas like uh, executive compensation as well. So it's just going to be tougher across the board. Um, so that, that's something that the banks will need to manage across. Just to sort of tie this all together, mm -hmm. are you more negative on the sector after seeing some of the initial earnings than you were a couple of weeks ago? At this point, things are, are actually just moving as expected. We're seeing some a drip in net interest income in the top line. The balance sheets are pretty stable. Deposits are coming back or, or stabilizing. Uh, you're, you're just in this this phase of of, of the cycle where you could you could see some asset quality deterioration, which we're seeing a bit from banks like Western Alliance and, and, and Citizen. So uh, things are steadying, but uh, there, there are some, some challenges going forward. You see it in the provision for credit losses this mm -hmm. morning from US Bank Corp as well, 821 million, the estimate for 37. Herman Chan of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Tom, you get the feeling that we just started a process back in March, April, that maybe the drama for now at least, and well, you can make your own call on that, is over. But ultimately to attract deposits, it's costing more. And you can see from bank to bank, and I think Herman did a great job of that, just how many banks need to pull back in certain areas of finance in this economy. We didn't touch on it, but the next time Mr. Chan's on, we've got to look also at the politics of this. If the Republicans take the high ground in different parts of Congress or the presidency one, two, three, five years out, how does that change the dialogue? Because to a great extent, the Republicans want that diversity of banks out there, profitable or less profitable. Don't you think the not. Democrats want the same thing? Yes, Want to maintain this sort you of regional it. network you're, you're of banks? Really, you're becoming very American. Thanks, so Tom. Very good. Well, I've lived there a long time. That. He also talked about it. Yeah, you, <laughs> Just you nailed saying. it. You, you nailed it. Yeah, I don't think this the year Democrats 18, want... Okay. The this Democrats don't, don't want... My I'm, eighth co year I'm counting. Uh, I don't think the Democrats... talks Demo me about me like I'm this foreign, <laughs> this foreign alien. Right off the boat, I, John, I'm, I'm looking, John, speaking... <laughs> Please, he doesn't foreign. work at passport control. <laughs> how, far, how, far how far is Oh, no, he, he yes, Honestly. he's going to... How far is Sheffield from London? I would say, at a guess, I would say four-hour drive. But on the train, we can go. You and I can go Sheffield Man U in October. You want to go and watch that? I don't know. You tell me. Okay. I have no clue. I can find us a better game to watch. I just want to hang with out with Sheffield, Jeff Leppard. Manchester United. Do you think they're going to the game? Oh, yeah, Joe will go. Yeah. Okay. Herman, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anna Han of Wells Fargo on a stock market coming up shortly. Your equity market right now on the SP. Positive 0.04%. Next hour, Goldman Sachs.
Fed is doing the job. The market is very excited around policy rates peaking. The question is, is there even more to go? I think there is if the rally becomes broader. The next six months, we're expecting inflation to come down. We hopefully are getting to the point where the aftershocks of the pandemic in terms of the economy are now settling out. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Wrapping up earnings on Wall Street, Goldman Sachs this hour, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brambitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market, the S&P on a two-day winning streak this morning, positive by 0.06%. We round things out with Mr. Solomon, TK, and Goldman Sachs in about 30 minutes. I think this is a bigger deal than normal. I don't know what to expect. I think from the media I've seen, everyone has a mystery upon this, including Sri Nataraj. And Shanali Bassett will give us uh, the, the details. So I look for a bombshell. I, I'm not wise enough to know that. But how do they respond off what we saw with Morgan Stanley? Wasn't Morgan Stanley down during the show? And then at some point, boom. James up, Goldman up in that interview with Shanali Tom yesterday yeah. afternoon, basically saying worse might be over for the investment yeah. bank. And he talked about the arc of the quarter, started with some uncertainty, Lisa, and then towards the end of it, got better. And that seems to be the theme of things were better than expected and continue to improve. And maybe we've turned the corner in an economy that everyone had basically said was going into a recession. The big read from all of the banks has been the economy is not in recession, doesn't look like it's going into recession anytime soon. And oh, yeah, by the way, consumers are still spending. Goldman Sachs will be more on the investment banking side. But how much of a tell is this for the rest of earnings? Like you've talked about it, Lisa, brilliantly over the last few months. There is a clear divide between the regionals and the big players. Tom, we talked about Western Alliance a lot already this morning, but the other players too, they're attracting the deposits, good news, it's costing them more, bad news, and that was widely anticipated. It anticipated, and it, as we've seen, it's come out pretty good. I'm really interested to see what everybody's summed earnings numbers do. I, I, as a rule, I don't really follow like 200 or 210 or 215 or we're down to 190, but I'm really interested to see how earnings pull back. I just can't get away, can't, can't wait to get away from the earnings on Wall Street, TK. I've never liked it. Much prefer the earnings from Silicon Valley and uh, tech. They wait until after the close. Fixation. They wait until after it the close. You That's know, why you like them better. It's a lot more relaxing. You know, you don't have to Dig sit in the morning just yeah, going through a yeah, bunch I of agree. numbers. No. I, that does nothing for me. Yeah. That doesn't, I, I, you know, Netflix so it's a, a little bit issue. later. It's timing. It's just not, don't it's like not it. talk about, Yeah, just do it after 4.30. Can I talk about the sign of the times? Go on. This is from the Twitter feed. I find it very valuable. The Twitter feed is bar chat. And, and it's the world's first ETF to offer 100% protection against losses, not including management and transaction fees, launched today in the U.S. This is Steve Johnson writing it up in the FT, the headline, first ETF with 100% protection against equity losses. John? Can you explain oh that? My, no, <laughs> I can't. And folks, this is the joke of the triple leverage uh, all cash fund. I mean, it's not a joke now. Somebody's actually doing this. Okay. They got that idea from you. I don't know. I want my royalty. But the, the bottom line is first ETF with 100% protect, protection against losses. Does that scream bull market? I need to read that story. I, yeah. I can't, I make, I can't I, make sense thank of you, that. Bar chat. Send me the link, That's all right? Uh, bar chat out on Twitter. Yeah. That sounds get, like bar chat. You know, I need they, to read that. Good. They I were not over in threats. Okay. Equities right now on the S&P positive by 0.04%. Lisa's going to give you the guide for the day ahead, the morning ahead in just a moment. Let's look back. UK inflation out earlier this morning downside surprised you can just look at the chart yields bank down by three basis points on a 10-year 375 over in the uk we're down 26 basis points at the front end of the curve off the back of this so sterling weakness as you start to pair some rate height bets back at the bank of england and some dollar strength against the euro too the euro against the dollar 112 16 we're negative 0.1 percent sterling Call it cable the pound against the US dollar. 129.15 opened up at 130 this morning, Lisa, and we are down 0.9%. It's been uh, really interesting to see some of the disinflation. As you've been mentioning, bank earnings do finish up today in about a half an hour with Goldman Sachs coming out. Very curious to see how they view investment banking, especially piggybacking on Morgan Stanley. We also are hearing from the regionals. We've heard from M&T, Citizens Financial. We're going to hear from Zions. The banking index of the S&P 500 back to levels that we haven't seen since March, but still a long way to go since they were pre some of the concerns in 
in March that percolated out later. We also get other earnings today. 20 S&P companies are reporting 4% of market capitalization of the S&P. We did get Carvana. That was a positive surprise. Those shares up 17%. We're also going to be hearing from Netflix, Tesla, and IBM after the bell. And at 8.30 a.m., we get U.S. building permits and housing starts. Last month, we saw a massive spike <clears throat> upward in housing starts. A lot of people are saying that's going to normalize, but still the feeling is in the housing sector, we're seeing a rebound from the lows, talking about a rolling recession. Maybe it's over in the housing market, even though potentially what, we haven't what, hit the peak in interest what, rates. Anecdotally, what do you see in housing? The walk-up I'm in, it's like a rental frenzy. I mean, there's people out in the street waiting to get in. Are you asking Lisa or me? Both of you. What okay. do you see in the market? <laughs> well, the market? I think each market There's no is, slowdown. There are different markets. <clears throat> New York City market is different from some of the Sun Belt markets that are slowing down. When you put it together on an aggregate level, rents are going down, prices are not. And that is sort of the dichotomy at the moment. Headline out of China, vowing to boost private economy and protect business as well. This is about boosting the private sector, not just helping out state firms. Oh, they that. say private companies to be treated the same with state firms, looking to optimise yeah. conditions for the private economy. The data just has not been great in China over the last few months, and I think that was capped off by the recent GDP numbers that we've had in the last couple of days, Tom. And it filters into this, this you know, unique fixation and need on property investment. When do they start really overtly bailing out property and I wouldn't look just at you know the three cities I'd go over to Chengdu where Sheffield United has a team and you know it, it goes across China as well it's going to have to be but we're going to see a, I think we're going to see a lot of this coming up it's domestic let's see if we get some proper domestic. stimulus out of that country Anna Han yeah. joined us now equity strategist over at Wells Fargo Anna good morning to you great to have you with us here in New York let's start with this you were looking for a 10 percent move a 10 percent correction you threw in the towel on that over the last month what's gone right for you and the team well, I'll say one of our biggest calls being tied to that AI trend, you know, one of our largest calls coming to this year, media and entertainment. And that's actually kept up with the tech sector, if not outperformed it. And I think that call we came in because we want to see that pivot of spending from really uh, the girdle goods into something more services, uh, a little more of that away from home trade. But at the same time, you see this kind of network and cable, these media groups still having that pull. We thought that might be that sweet balance. That was one of our largest calls. And right now, as we we see it. We stepped off that pullback call. Well, you know, we'll throw in the towel. We'll admit ourselves on that one. But something we're still watching here is, you know, what is going to be the pace of this rally in the back half this year? And can this AI and really Uber top led rally continue? I think that's what's really weighing on people's minds. Your mathiness informs your research note. I'm fascinated what you think about what revenues are going to do made up of unit and price. And the, the, the calculus jargon here is the partial differentials of units and revenues. How do you see that playing out over the next year? No, that's very important, right? When you have this top line figure, it's important to figure if that is declining, you know, how much can uh, margins really increase to make up for it? And if it doesn't, then what about prices versus volumes? We've seen volumes declining. If those volumes are declining and price elasticity returns to normal, then what happens to that bottom line? These margins continue to be pressured, continue to be compressed. But so far, the market seems to look through those things. Perhaps they're trading already on next year's earnings or expectations. What we've seen is not just the one and done, but what if we get rate cuts? That easing also trickles into investors' minds and helps look at equity valuations uh, above what perhaps we expected. So do earnings matter or do you just basically look at what the returns have been and then just say, we're going to keep buying because everybody else is? You know, that momentum trade is always interesting. You know, do we stay on the train? Who's going to be the first to leave the party? But no one wants to be the last. I think with earnings, the more important is directional than really the figure. Like Tom mentioned earlier, you know, is it 200? Is it 210? What is it? But it's more the sentiment of how much contraction are we seeing if it's going to be light enough for investors to look through? And really, what is driving it? Is it the consumer in dire need or pulling back sharply? That's not what we're hearing. Even with bank earnings early in the season, we see that consumers still remains resilient, uh, wages remain resilient, labor markets are supporting that. But that general slowing tells us things are cooling a bit. But if the Fed is able to give us that Goldilocks, almost that uh, Powell put in terms of not just equities, but really economic uh, consumer spending, then that's a kind of a happy scenario for a lot of people. It's a confusing market for people who are trying to look at facts and 
and extrapolate out some sort of price target. From your vantage point, how bullish can you get just with a momentum trade, even as you see some of the earnings come in softer than you'd like to see? Well, the momentum trade actually has been flipping a little. You know, what we've seen was market leaders, and you're seeing the momentum factor, the top, top leaders, aside from those AI names, have actually started to rotate. And that rotation can also bring a little churn and volatility. So when we think about how long the market can ride on momentum, quite long, no doubt. But what leads that momentum, who those momentum leaders are, I think that continues to have some mean reversion to it. And that's what we use to look at technicals and think about where we want to position. Shine a light on your client conversations if you can. Do you sense capitulation <clears throat> after the last couple of weeks? I don't think we're sensing that just yet. I think right now, the beginning of this year burned a lot of people. A lot of came, people came in more conservative. You know, you were mentioning that ETF earlier. We're worried about uh, protecting against losses. People were happy to take 4%, 5% um, in, in some sort of a bond investment, and now they've missed out on 20% in the first half of this year. So that kind of mentality, I think they have to uh, remain strong the rest of this year. But in what underweight names have been most painful, that's going to be the hard part is when do they capitulate on that and we have not seen that this quite is yet. what Lisa's getting at really if you've sat on cash and you've missed out on this rally and you feel foolish are you chasing the winners big tech or are you going to places where you haven't seen the gains Curry. when you have those conversations what do they sound like you know, I will say, you know, we're not bringing out the tissue boxes just yet. It's not full tears, but it is a difficult conversation. You want to be, thank you. <laughs> you want to be chasing in some ways. Uh, you you really believe that I, I've got to make up for this. I've got to get back on this train. At the same time, when that train's left, look for growth opportunities in other parts of the market, some place where maybe valuations are a little more friendly. And if we do get this growing well, belief on, that we're one and done. Come on, where's a friendly valuation out there? Enlighten me. Where's a friendly a friendly valuation. Well, we can look for actual uh, sustained growth. Autos? Autos? I think autos, given the economy we expect in the slowdown, that's a little bit of a hard sell for okay. people. Um, just busted I thought you were going to say Carvana. Well, friend, friendly valuations in Carvana friendly this morning. Walmart's trading at 24 times earnings. That's nuts. Is that friendly? I, I don't know. I've never seen it. That's absolutely nuts. Anna, thank you. Wonderful, as always. Anna, hand there of Wells Fargo. They were looking for a 10% correction. They backed away from that in the last month. We're looking for some more earnings a little bit later on this afternoon, this time from Netflix. Going into all of that, equity futures at the moment look like this. Welcome to the program. If you are just joining, we are positive by 0.01%. Looking out for those Netflix Huge earnings month. a little bit later. We'll get the views of Victoria Fernandez across Mark in the next hour. Looking forward to that conversation. Netflix year to date up 61% percent cracking down on password sharing we understand that that's leading tom to more signups i just wonder what the net figure looks like how many people just cancelled just cancelled and said yeah i'll go no, there all you. i know my anecdote is it's the only thing at home that's used besides youtube i mean netflix gets a lot of lifting at the keen household and i mean i mean the others peacock didn't they raise prices yesterday i have peacock for one reason one reason only. Yeah. Premier League football. I, re, I, That's re, it. Just, That's I won't it. do it. I'll listen on the BBC radio. Yeah. It's that each, each particular service caters to a different demographic. Peacock raised its prices by $1. Netflix is catering to the teenager and the preteen. That is my sense based on some of the programming that is coming out and the series that are must watch that everyone's oh, talking on. about. And that's, I mean, it's, it's a whole host of them and they're addicted and it's just a problem. But, you know, this is the reason why. That feels like home life. That was, <laughs> was that the description? No, no, no. It was not personal in any way. Uh, no, not at all. No, not at all. You but see I how, how expensive Hulu is now. Whoa. Like in the 80s or something like that. So it's the whole ridiculous. package has just gone. It's the and then it's gone nuts. Somebody had a great, you know, they just have to raise prices to find profitability. Good luck with now that. Now you've got these strikes, these writing strikes. Yeah. I'm going to speak to an analyst a little yeah. bit later who That's thinks right. Netflix is actually best positioned. We need to go to LA to cover that because of the catalog they've already got ready to to unveil. We'll talk about interesting things later. Well, that's good. <laughs> How about now? I guess uh, under a Biden administration, Biden America, you'd expect this. If you notice recently, President Trump went up in the polls and was uh, actually surpassing President Biden for re-election. So what do they do now? Weaponize government to go after their number one opponent. 
Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy. We'll get a view on that from Washington, D.C. with Anne Marie in just a moment. Let's turn to what's happening in this market at the moment. We are moments away from numbers from Goldman Sachs. 13 minutes away from those earnings. Equities going into it just slightly negative now by 0.02%. I think we can call this unchanged through the morning so far. In the bond market, huge rally. Nothing unchanged about it in the gilt market in the UK. Yields aggressively lower, following softer than expected inflation. Following softer than expected inflation in the US last week. So that's good news, I guess, if you're bullish bonds. We're down another two basis points in the Treasury market. 3.7639. Bit of dollar strength out there against the euro, much more so against the pound. The euro against the dollar clinging on to 112 sterling clinging on to 129 opened up at 130 36 we are down by 0.9 percent we are back down to 129 14 on the pound uk gilts came in I, you know, aggressively i don't i don't, I don't down follow hard. it but i thought of you when i saw that they really thank you around. for thinking of me Yield when you down. see the gilt market that's once a year you i know. appreciate right, that thank, thank, you. You. thank you thanks but they they moved you know it's all there is to it warms my heart <laughs> That you got in this morning and yeah, thought of me you know, th as you look through the Bloomberg. You know, That's beautiful. It's Thanks. Good. Mixed market, Dow up 30. <laughs> Particularly when points. it was rallying, too. That yes. meant a lot. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Joining us now to say the show, Emily <laughs> Horton. She's a Bloomberg Washington correspondent, star of balance of power as well. I am fascinated, Anne Marie, what you're going to say to Governor Christie this evening. I heard the Speaker of the House there, and I get the ballet. I read it with Bloomberg, I read it, New York Times, Washington Post. How do you treat a Chris Christie on set tonight? I think you treat him like a candidate. I think he's really obviously wants to have this lane where he is one of the few that really goes directly after the former president. We know that about him, but I think it's also important to make sure we're getting his take on a number of important issues that you would ask any uh, presidential candidate, not just what he thinks about the former president. I think it was so astonishing yesterday was that there was supposed to be this huge reset for the DeSantis camp. They were doing a sit-down interview yeah. with a non-conservative uh, network, and yet the first few minutes um, of that interview was dominated by the former president. He just continues to really take the oxygen out of the room, and it's very hard for other people to, one, talk about the policies they would want to enact if they were elected to become president of the United States, so I think it's very interesting to also not just get everyone's take on how they feel about the former president, but also how they feel about a range of issues that are top of mind of the American people. So do they want him on that debate stage next month or not? <laughs> That's a great question. I think I think the American people probably want it because they'd like to see uh, exactly how Trump would interact with a lot of these individuals. You definitely, I think, Governor Chris Christie wants it. I think he's looked directly into the camera on a number of networks saying, don't be a coward and show up. Um, but potentially, the former president could just, again, take the oxygen right out of that debate stage, stage and make it all about himself. And it, then it means that sh others struggle to really talk about substantive issues. Um, it's an interesting one. The issue, of course, becomes if he doesn't join the debate, how would he distract from the debate? Because everyone says, even if he's not on that stage, he will do something else. And potentially there's, you know, this worry about counter-programming. How much is the sort of message of the former president's resonating continually? How much is his support among the population of Republicans continuing to hold strong and to suck the oxygen out of the room, regardless of any allegations or charges? It's the base. The base continues to stay with him. They will not leave him. And that is the stronghold he has on the party. I mean, this is very much so what we talked about yesterday regarding 2016. The former president was able to win a plurality. He was able to maintain a stronghold on the base, which is why you hear a lot of individuals like Governor Sununu of New Hampshire come out and say what is so important as we gear up for 2024 is, sure, everyone can jump in now, put their hat in the ring, but is it important to know when to exit? when to leave the stage and when to throw your support by someone else. So the remainder of them could potentially oust Trump if they're able to coalesce around another individual. And then it doesn't become a plurality again. Uh, but this is something the Republican par Party is obviously uh, struggling with at the moment. And especially happens when the news just continues to dominate around the former president. Yesterday, of course, was the target letter he said he had received. So that just means 
we're going to be focusing on another potential indictment. Should we be focusing more on President Biden and potential competitors with him within the Democratic Party? We have seen at least one much discredited. Uh, but there is a question around his popularity, his lack of ability to really draw in younger voters at a time when, you know, this is getting to be a competitive race. So at the moment, Democrats are still coalescing around Biden. They maintain that he is their candidate, even if, you know, there are whispers or under their breath, there are concerns about what you see show up in poll after poll, which is a concern about the current president's age. By the end of a second term, he would be 86. There's also concerns the Republican Party as well about the age of their current front runner when you look <clears throat> at the candidates, former President Trump and his older age as well. The thing with Biden is that, yes, there's RFK, but many just shrug him off as, as not a real challenger. The potential issue for the Democrats would be if the no labels camp really starts to pick up. And you had Senator Joe Manchin up in New Hampshire kicking that off and basically flirting with potentially what would be this third party run of 2024. At the moment, it does seem like he's just flirting with it. But when you read the stuff from PIMCO, Libby Cantrell, or Greg Vallier, everyone continues to say that if a no labels, a third party, was to get into this mm -hmm. race, the votes would take away from the Democrats. They would hurt the Democrats. They would hurt Biden more so than they would hurt a Republican Party. So I think that is potentially one of the real challenges that the Democrats and Biden could face, less so from within the Democratic Party. Emery, completely unfair question, but let's go there. To get to Friday, into the weekend, what will you be watching for from the Trump camp? I mean, does he need more attorneys, different attorneys? Does he need to put a cork in his mouth or not? What, what, what's the thing you're looking for with all your reading on this? I'm definitely not in a position to give the former president legal advice on whether or not he needs more attorneys or better attorneys. We do know that he struggled for a while to find fit attorneys when he was dealing with the documents case, which he's still dealing with the documents case. There was actually a hearing about that yesterday. Right. Um, the one thing we obviously want to watch is we've seen him previously get target letters and then alert the world that he would be indicted. This last target letter, he said that it would be about four days potentially when he can get indicted. Um, so that, I'm looking at the letter now. So he said he received the notice on Sunday night, giving him, quote, very short four days to report to the grand jury, which almost always means an arrest and an indictment. So I think that's what everyone's waiting and seeing. MH, it's hard to know for a lot of people, and I'm talking of the electorate here, which investigations to take seriously and which ones to ignore. Do you pay attention to all of them? Just as a journalist, from your perspective, which of the investigations currently underway are more serious? Well, there's obviously the documents case that, that is incredibly serious, that right now we know that he was ready, was indicted, and that, that'll be tried in Florida. This would be incredibly serious as well. ABC News this morning says this target letter to their reporting mentions three federal statutes, conspiracy to commit offense or to defraud the United States. That is one of them, tampering with a witness, victim, or an informant. These could be very serious charges. And then the third one... We do not know yet, but that is potentially waiting in the wings, is the Fulton County indictment from their attorney general in, in Georgia. So I would say those three are the top ones. But beyond that, there's a defamation case, there's cases against his company, and all this is going to be playing out as he is running for president. MH, thank you. Looking forward to the conversation a little bit later. Be sure to catch Republican presidential candidate and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie on Balance of Power at 5 p.m. Eastern Time with MH and Joe Matthew. Earnings out just seconds ago from Goldman Sachs. Second quarter net revenue, 10.9 billion U.S. dollars, the estimate 10.46. Fixed sales and trading revenue, big number for Goldman Sachs, of course. That comes in at 2.71 billion. The estimate was 2.8. 8 1. A lot to work through here. Let's get to Shanali Basak, our chief Wall Street correspondent here at Bloomberg, for more. Hey, Shanali. If you take a look at the numbers, John, it's pretty incredible because even though they beat on the top line, there was a pretty significant miss on the bottom line here for Goldman Sachs and the lowest ROE that they've seen in years, let alone a miss for the market as well. So, what happened here? There's a few items here that are a little bit hard to parse through. There is the asset management unit that has a one point point 
two, nearly $1.2 billion hit to pre-tax earnings because of the hits they've taken to their commercial real estate portfolio. Remember, this is all part of the changing of Goldman Sachs. They're trying to reduce their balance sheet when it comes to the asset and wealth manager. We could talk more about commercial real estate later because they also have a hit tied to Green Sky. This is hundreds of millions of dollars right down because they're taking a goodwill charge tied to that business that they are looking to essentially sell all or parts of. They've announced strategic options for that business. So they've really bit the bullet here in this quarter, and you're seeing it down in the results. What was good about the results? They had equities trading that not only came in above expectations, they also came in above Morgan Stanley. That has been an investment line for Goldman Sachs, and they are beating pretty significantly. This is, I believe, the third quarter they've come in in the last year above Morgan Stanley. Tick was a light miss, and it was also a little bit deeper of a turn down than expected. You know, we're going to want to hear from David Solomon and the executives here on whether there is a turnaround here in the trading, in the investment banking story, whether things have really bottomed, because that kind of a tone will set the stage for the rest of the year and the ability to bring in more money, because they have done quite well here in equities, and they are also bringing in record management fees. So the, have they taken the yeah. worst of the pain at Goldman Sachs? You know, it's completely unfair to you, Chanel, because you, you're doing a great job on this with all these banks doing this. In, in real time. I'm buried in the PowerPoint, 15 pages, I'm on page six. And essentially, as an amateur, I'm saying they did a 21% margin in wealth management, but that was knocked down to a year-to-date pre-tax margin of 6%, quote, from the results of Marcus Loans and historical principal investments. Does Marcus permeate the Goldman Sachs world or is it compartmentalized under some form of consumer banking uh, format? Listen, when you look at the Marcus business, they have sold much of the loan business that they've said that they're going to do. In fact, they took a $150 million uh, gain from the sale of that loan portfolio. So again, this is a fairly messy, messy restructuring of Goldman Sachs's business lines and that pivot away from that core consumer business into asset and wealth. But here's the problem, asset and wealth this quarter was really hit by that commercial real estate business. And so they can't seem to get out of it fast enough when it comes to reducing their balance sheet, though they are on track to reduce that balance sheet according to their goals. But it is a tough market, as we know, for commercial real estate. Now, will the market forgive them for it? Those debt and equity investments have also come in below expectations at a time where Goldman is trying to raise more money to have third-party asset management. So again, you have two things, Tom. You have that historical consumer business that we know has hit a rough time and that they're trying to change quickly, as well as their growth area, asset and wealth, which they're trying to sell the story for, but is coming in short this quarter because of that real estate hit. Shanali, to wrap this all together, is David Solomon losing the room? Is he basically losing the oxygen and the support to keep going as they keep underperforming the likes of their one-time big rival, Morgan Stanley? There's no way to say this differently because the ROE of 4% being worse than expected, as well as being not only the worst among, um, you know, that it's only had in years for itself, it's also the worst among every big bank this quarter. And so that is certainly a tough pill to swallow for Goldman Sachs and its executives. But the question is, is what kind of legroom does that give David to make all these changes he says he's going to make? He had his strategic plan when he first stepped in, you know, 2018, 2019. Now, he has a new strategic plan. So what is the timeline for that plan to start showing more success? Interestingly, Goldman today into this morning is still trading at a higher price to book ratio than Bank of America. And so people have been rewarding these institutional businesses and they've been winning in equities. But is that enough for the market when they're going through all these big changes? The stock is slightly softer this morning with negative 0.08% wrapping up earnings on Wall Street with Goldman Sachs the last out of the gate after the financials. We'll move over to Silicon Valley, Big Tech, Tesla, and the likes of Netflix coming after the close a little bit later. Let's stay on Goldman and wrap up the quarter for Wall Street. Shanali, based on what you've heard from JP Morgan, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, City, Goldman, where do these rank this quarter? 
you know, J.P. Morgan was the unequivocal blowout in the room, right? I mean, they came in with the highest ROE as well as this massive profit jump, even without First Republic. That would have been a huge jump in net income, where you're seeing the big investment banks, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, take a little bit of a dip. Uh, the Goldman decline in profit is significant, and the expense bases are high for every one of these banks, all for different reasons. And so can this comeback in investment banking, can this rise in net interest income, can that save Wall Street this year? Here's my question. Shanali, thank you. Stock's negative by 0.7%. Shanali, stay close. Shanali's going to come back a little bit later as we work through some of those earnings calls with Goldman Sachs and David Solomon. Goldman, slightly negative. Let's get to the broader market and take a look at equities. If we can take a look at the S&P 500, the NASDAQ and the Russell. There we go. Futures unchanged on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're positive by about 0.14%. Slightly firmer there. Year to day, absolutely flying by more than 40% on that index. As I've mentioned a few times, attention is going to shift away from the financials and we'll get to some of the tech players, the dominant stories of the year so far in the stock market over the year next week when we hear from Alphabet, Meta, Microsoft, then on to Apple in early August. As I've said, Netflix coming up a little bit later. In the bond market, you will notice there's a bit of a rally. Yields are lower. This off the back of developments in the UK. Inflation coming through softer than expected in the United Kingdom this morning, following a similar move in the United States last week. So we pair back the rate hike bets, not just in the States in the last week, but also in the UK this morning. The gilt market rallying really hard, down more than 20 basis points at the very front end of the gilt curve. In the Treasury curve, the two-year yields are lower there by three or four basis points, 472.98. Tom, on a 10-year, we're down two basis points yeah. at 376. I don't reinversion your 97 basis points, not to out to something outrageous, but certainly if, uh, versus the whole market waiting for housing data in one hour. Uh, we, we've had a, a new inversion back, a trend towards where we were a week ago. And the inflation metric, the 10-year real yield, it, it's just not done much. But nevertheless, it just won't give way to that disinflationary story. It won't make the next lug lower to signal disinflation. Let's finish on foreign exchange, Tom. Push it through the FX market. More recently, you've seen a much, much stronger euro. That backs away a touch. We're down to yeah. 11 We're negative 0 0.16% <clears throat> there on the euro. The bigger move in G10 is in sterling. Cable, the pound against the US dollar, much, much weaker pound this morning off the back of those inflation figures. The pound dropping by almost one full percentage point against the dollar. That's a weaker pound sterling, 129.10. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Goldman Sachs out with earnings just moments ago. The headlines read as follows. Second quarter net revenue, 10.9 billion. The estimate, 10.46. Fixed sales and trading revenue, $2.71 billion. The estimate, 2.81, so a miss there. Key measure of profitability, that'll get talked about a lot. Coming in much softer versus its peers. Goldman Sachs in the moment, Tom, negative by, let's call it 0.3% and just dancing around in negative territory. On radio and television uh, this morning, we welcome all of Global Wall Street and they know Allison Williams, senior analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence, did brilliant on this. And just sitting here, folks, to look at the 15-page Goldman Sachs Solomon PowerPoint, I'm looking at it in my own way. The way to watch Allison Williams to my left go over this puppy. How alone is Goldman Sachs right now? My basic take of 15 pages of PowerPoint is no other bank is displaying this urgency. Well, I think, uh, you know, Goldman is in the middle of changing their business. And so that's always messy and, and tends to be the, the weak one, right? So um, what we saw this quarter um, Chanelli pointed out the very low ROE, and a lot of that is due to the commercial real estate impairment. So you've heard me talk and, and probably many others that commercial real estate is going to be a long story for the banks, right. for most banks lending. But <clears throat> Goldman Sachs has a sizable investment portfolio. This is something that, um, you know, prior to the financial crisis was significantly built up. They're shifting that strategy. Right. But they're taking those hits today because they're marked to market. And so, if anything, I think it highlights uh, the it highlights the fact that they've already under they're already in process of unwinding that strategy, right? So instead of putting all these investments on their balance sheet, they're going to a model where they invest alongside investors and and have fees. And there will be right there will be right. write downs, right? There's gains and there's losses. In that 15-page PowerPoint, I'm thinking like a Betsy Grasick, Mike Mayo kind of question, which is the ratio or page or deck that shows the Solomon excellence right now? Which shows that he's he's writing the ship and moving forward? 
I think, you know, I'm not sure if the number one number is in this presentation. I think to, to the point that we just uh, spoke about the alternatives, the alternatives fundraising, I think, is what's most positive about the future. I think from a, an analyst, whether a sell side or buy side analyst a point of view, um, you know, the cost ratio is the thing that um, – analysts are going to focus on because we did have these big impairments. So obviously that is suppressing returns. But if we strip all that out, Goldman still has to do better on the efficiency line. So we're now at the end of the earnings season for the big banks on Wall Street. Is the conclusion that JP Morgan won and Goldman Sachs lost? I mean, from a bottom line perspective, you, you could say that. I would say from a broader picture, credit card is the business. And if you are exposed to that business, you are doing well. And I think we're going to see that JP Morgan, not just versus a Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley, but versus some of the regional banks as their results come out. Credit card is where the loans are growing. We know it's a very profitable product over time. You could say it's over earning right now. So as those losses continue to, to tick up uh, a year from now, we might be talking about winners and losers for the quarter based on that business. But certainly it is I wouldn't say Main Street's winning over Wall Street because it's a very specific part of Main Street, right? Like yeah. it's not the bread and butter commercial loan. So it's not really Main Street because card is a little bit of a different business. But but, but Wall Street certainly taking it a little bit on the chin this quarter. Especially because the people who are getting this credit card business, the consumers, have very high FICO scores. It's not as Correct. though they are on, their, uh, on the floor trying to make ends meet. We are seeing, though, aside from credit card lending, a real decline, a real deceleration in loans by both big and small banks and a real retraction. Uh, Apollo's uh, Torsten Slock coming out with a deck talking about how much he expects this to continue with lending to slow. What's your view? I mean, is that basically the conclusion here as they pay up for deposits and as they start to get a lot more cautious about who they'll lend to? I do think that the commercial environment will continue to slow, of course. How, how uh, bad that gets depends on your view of the economy. It seems like um, you know, in general, the market's view of the economy is improving. Um, but uh, I think that until we get that recession, we'll be talking about the recession when it comes or if it comes, et cetera. And so I think that there, there does have to be some element of factoring in the potential downside. But the fact is commercial loan growth is slowing. We saw right. improvement. You know, Bank America talked about utilization rates. Their customers um, have sort of steadied on, on that front. But for the quarter, net interest income, that was the big story for upside. That's where you got the big upside from J.P. Morgan. Again, I think that's due to card. The other thing is that the cost of deposits, we've been talking about this a lot, especially since the bank failures in March, where there was a deposit flight. I think that has studied to a migration, which is what you would expect. And I think that there is a bit of a relief, right. at least at the big banks, that it's not – it, it's steadying. Right. It's not as bad as feared. And the outlook is also steadying. I've got the chart normalized from that Thursday in August, August of 2007. And it's all the different banks. And as an aside, folks, Goldman Sachs looks pretty good there versus Morgan Stanley when you go back 15 years or whatever it is. It is stunning how Citigroup is alone. What is the urgency to get, you know, I, I say Bitcoin, BitDog. What's the urgency to get CityDog righted fast? It is an outlier of all these fancy names. It is an outlier, and it's probably, uh, I would say, maybe the most frustrating stock for people that so cover what do they financials. Do? I said this to it's Corbin been years, Davos. It's been years what and years. Do, it, it, it's, John, it's flatlined from the spring of 2009 as a general statement. What's the to-do for Citigroup to join the team? I think I think Jane is doing it. I think uh, Michael Corbett started it. Jane Fra Frazier is taking sort of a steeper axe. And perhaps the best thing that could have happened to them is this regulatory scrutiny and the fact that the regulators said, look, it's been a long time. You really just need to get things in order. So they're making these necessary investments, which continues to weigh on the short term, but in the long term, will finally get them to be a more efficient bank. And I think what Jane is doing in terms of you know focusing on the profitability of markets, you know, the international retail banking business is a business that only two banks were ever in globally, HSBC and Citigroup. And we've seen it doesn't work. And I think that is finally that, that sort of mea culpa. Instead of having these bragging rights, let's you know not focus on the top line. Let's focus on the bottom line. Best thing that's happening to Goldman this morning that Tom's talking about City. 
and not Goldman. Alison, thank you. <laughs> Alison Williams there of Bloomberg Intelligence. TK, they're probably happy with that, aren't they? That you're talking about Jane Fraser's I, I, challenges I, I, and not David well, Solomon's. First, first of all, I'm an amateur in this. Right. I mean, Alison 100%. Williams is legendary. Yeah. And, and you got all these adults we talk to uh, about this. I just don't think enough's been said about going back 15, 16 years. Goldman Sachs, based on the Bloomberg data I have, has outperformed Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley's really come along coming out of the pandemic wealth manager. We know the story. But I don't know if this is a blank fine blame, a Solomon blame. There's all this angst out here. And the fact is, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, Bank of America down below, and then City Dog brings up the back end. That's, is that your new name? It's my new name. <laughs> Rephrase yeah. shop. So like, get it going. I mean, I, I, I was sitting on a seat. I was younger. I was thinner talking to the football <laughs> player from Harvard. Corbett, get it's this thing Corbett's going. It's not Corbett's fault, is it? That you're, no, you, no, you this is Mr. Wild. I, you know who I'd like to talk to about this? I'd like to talk <laughs> to Jamie going? Diamond about this. I'm sure Jamie would, Jamie would love to be on the record I, on this. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, no, no from way back with Bank One. I mean, Allison's over there nodding her head, but come on. I mean, <laughs> it's, the it's the ugliest chart in global finance. But, and I'll just, I'll just add in, because I do think it's important, because we get so wrapped up in the quarter and who won this quarter and who lost this quarter. But it is important that, you know, an investor has to take the long view, right? And the quarter is just mile markers on that long view. And so, you know, and, and you know, so Goldman, it's a tough quarter, but what, what's the journey they're on? The question, you know, we just look at it to see, like, are they making the steps to get there? And then, as you said, pulling back and looking at, at Citigroup, it can sometimes be a long journey. Alison, thank you. It's a journey. It's, it's new CFA. Thank you journey. very much. It is a journey. It's a journey. You are just tuning in. This is a journey. Welcome to the program. Equity futures negative 0.05%. For Goldman, the stock is slightly negative by 0.4% of Goldman Sachs. Didn't talk much about the headcount. 45,000 employees oh. at the end of March. At the end of June, 44,600. 5% fewer workers at Goldman Sachs, Tom. Seen a lot of that, haven't we? Compared to the pandemic hiring I, boom, that stuff is over. Yeah, and I, you know, it'll save it for another day, but I think the cost discipline here forward, uh, given the interest rate regime that we've returned to is going to be interesting. Stacked hour coming up for you. Amanda Lynham of BlackRock coming up shortly. Neil Dutter of Renmac in the next hour. Look out for that conversation. Equity futures right now. Just a touch softer from New York. Good morning. There's no question that with China GDP being slow and their inflation being relatively tame, uh, that tends to create more disinflation and slower growth in the United States, all things being equal. And I think it's a factor to consider. That's the voice I've missed on the FOMC. The former Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan there weighing in on the next move for the Federal Reserve. That decision, by the way, is a week today. A week today for the Fed's next move, and most people anticipate that next move will be a rate hike. It's not about July. It's about what comes in September and beyond, and for that matter, in August in Jackson Hole, if Chairman Powell, as we anticipate, does deliver a speech. And a compare and contrast from Jackson Hole last year to where we are, spot the difference in the labour market. Unemployment in at around 3.5%. Spot the difference with Fed funds. That's easier to do. We've gone from zero through 5%, and yet still we haven't bitten into this labour market in quite the way that people thought we would. Equities right now on the S&P 500, negative by 0.07%, just a bit softer there. The rally in Treasury continues. We're down three basis points on a 10-year in the US, down much more in the UK as we get another soft inflation print. In the West, Tom, in developed economies, the UK today, the US last week. We wrap up earnings on Wall Street with Goldman. Goldman Sachs, the stock just slightly negative by 0.5%. Fixed sales and trading revenue coming in a little lighter. So many headlines you need to get through, but of all the big banks on Wall Street over the last week, at least I think most people conclude in that this was where there was going to be an area of weakness, and you can identify that this morning. They lowered expectations, and they didn't cross that hurdle. And that's the reason why we just heard Allison Williams say, Goldman Sachs is the loser of this earnings season, and J.P. Morgan is the winner. Going forward, if that changes, then the question really lies with the Morgan Stanley uh, question with James Gorman, which is, do we now see a revival? TK, wrapping up earnings on Wall Street. I, I think with Goldman Sachs, you go through the 15 pages, and you look at consumer and Marcus. And as we were talking about in the break, I mean, it's a people business at the end of the day. 
And, you know, I'm going to cut Mr. Solomon some major slack. That's he a was first given for you. This. It is. Yeah. It is. He was given this. He was handed this, and he's managed it forward. And, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, on, on some of the pages, they're actually doing well. Number one in this, number one in, in, in that. They just got to work it out and get through it. And they're doing it in a new interest rate regime, which I think is not a small note. Yes, agreed. Five is different to zero. Yeah. Yes, that would be true. It was free money and easy uh, before that. We're going to move on right now. Amanda Lynham joins us now, head of macro credit research at BlackRock. But there is an equivalent overlay here, and that is Mr. Solomon and others, including Mr. Fink, have to deal with the new interest rate regime, which harkens back 16 years, 20 years, 25 years. And as you brilliantly say in your note of macro credit research, there's a new higher cost of capital. Have we adjusted to it or are we in early innings? I think, and good morning, thank you for having me. I think we're in the early innings of adjusting to that. And I think one of the really interesting things from my perspective and looking through the regional bank earnings, even yesterday and, and, and earlier last, last week, was that companies are taking reserves against interest sensitive pockets of the market, like commercial real estate, for example. Uh, but they're saying that they'll need those reserves even if there is a soft landing. And so it's not necessarily reserves in the event of a worst case downturn, but it's reserves um, even if we kind of get an okay outcome. And I think that's true for areas like leverage loans, for example, where we expect the default rate to outpace that for high yield bonds. And I think it's also true for areas like commercial real estate, where we, um, as you know, Tom wrote that we think we're in the early innings of that distress cycle. And I think um, what's really challenging in, in this pocket of the, of the market is that there's going to be a, a new sense of price discovery. So maybe the LTVs and the cap rates that the market has used in previous previous periods to kind of understand where the floor is on commercial real estate, they might not be as relevant this time around. And so rather, we'll look at cash flow of assets. We'll look at the basis to require to be bringing those properties up to, to market. And that's very heterogeneous. And I don't think we know the answer to that. For How ring fenced do you think that pain might be? How isolated do you think it will be in credit? I, I think for I think we're expecting most of the pain to be on the smaller banks that the data just tells us have had bigger exposure over time. Um, we're also seeing that's where a lot of the reserves are being upticked, but I don't think it's limited to those areas. And I think uh, in some ways the cash is fungible across the system. And so if that's a reason for certain parts of the banking system to pull back on their lending, then that may be felt in other areas of the market that aren't necessarily directly related, uh, but impacted nonetheless. And even as, as is right now, we're seeing a big contraction in auto lending as well as others, aside from the credit card loan area, which seems to be on fire. How much do you expect that to accelerate and pressure credit in other areas? Yeah, I mean, you guys were talking about it earlier this morning with some of the restructuring news, and I think it's interesting that companies are already restructuring some of the maturities that are coming out 2025, 2026, 2027. Um, and so I think on the corporate side, that's definitely going to be a pressure point. On the consumer side, I think it was really interesting. You had mentioned that um, the Federal Reserve data for the Center of Microeconomic Analysis earlier this week. There was a chart in there that showed financial distress and it showed the percentage of consumers that thought they might need $2,000 coming up uh, over the over a period of time and those who thought they would be able to get it. And those numbers are moving in the wrong direction. And so I think for those for the consumers at the low end of the, of the economic spectrum, I think there's going to be a, a pressure point. That being said, I view it as more normalization as opposed to deterioration in the consumer. That's where I was going to yeah. go with this, especially at a time when some people are saying we've only seen a small yeah. part of the ramifications from the Fed tightening cycle. Yeah. How far do you expect the deterioration to go and how will it be expressed in your credit markets? So I, I think, um, you know, the first half of 2023 has surprised us to the upside in, in the terms of the resilience of the corporate credit market, specifically um, when you look at the high yield market and the leverage loan market. That hasn't extended, though, all the way down to the very low end of the capital structure. So if you were to look at the current level of the high yield index, so 380 basis points, at that level, you would think that triple C spreads would be tighter than where they are now, around 100, 150 basis points tighter, actually. So we're not seeing 
doing that. So I think there's a limit to investors' comfort with over-leveraged, deteriorating fundamentals. Yeah. That probably extends. And so there's a lot of talk about kind of the equity market rally broadening. What I, what I actually think is there's probably some scope for resilience still at the high end of the high yield spectrum, specifically because supply has been so low. Technicals, which are really important, as you know, in the credit market have been so friendly. Um, but I think that's probably a near term issue. Over time, I would expect there to be a bit more weakness in that market as we see defaults flow through, as we <clears> see <throat> risk premium rebuild. Importantly, we don't view a recession as a necessary ingredient for an uptick in defaults. So similar to how these banks are talking about, um, you know, we'll need these commercial real estate reserves even in a soft landing. I think enough damage has been done in the cost of capital environment right. that Tom alluded to that we'll see an uptick in defaults regardless. It won't be broad based. It'll be more focused on, for example, the leverage loan market on a relative right. basis. But I don't think we're immune. Let's cut to the BlackRock chase. The bottom line is Goldman Sachs has a page on commercial real estate. Chanelli covered that. Allison Williams alluded to that. We were talking this this morning, uh, we've got our wonderful offices at Queen Victoria Street in London, and there's a Motel 6 I stay at across the street. It's like two blocks mm. away. And in between Damn our market. office and the Motel 6 is this office building. It's a B property, and it's in the media this morning. Basically, it's at half its value. I'm speaking as an amateur. Maybe it's 40 percent, 60 percent discount. That seems awfully pervasive in each and every city. How do black rocks, how do black stones, how do black this, black that, how do they adjust to that over, say, two years, over a refi cycle? Yeah. So, I, 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 again, I think we're early in the innings of this distress Agreed. cycle. And I think what's really important is the price discovery. I, I think one of the other points of conservatism that are it's really going to be relevant in this particular cycle is that we look a lot at kind of class A, class B, class C properties. But the market is evolving so quickly that those class A properties may be reclassified lower going forward. This is really, I forward. can't say enough. Enough, John, about um, how this is important. And, and I, I think just because something is class A today, um, as it becomes older and ages and there's more competition and there's more price discovery, probably lower in competing assets, that may price get all turned on its loss. head. That's, 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 it's Amanda. like faint echoes of 15 years ago when I hear you say things <laughs> yeah. like that. It, it really is. I'm not saying it's as scary or will yeah. be, just, you yeah. know, some similarities there, some parallels. I think it's going to be a longer default cycle. In the financial crisis, we know that was a multi-year cycle. Perhaps it gets front-loaded a bit. Is it into the market now? I, Give I me don't. A heads up no, here. I don't. I don't think it is priced in it because of that. Price discovery is is lacking. Price discovery. That's my uh, phrase for the day. Amanda, thank you. <laughs> Just brilliant, home. excellent as always. Amanda Lyon and Lights Black out. Rock. Lights Absolute out. clinic on commercial real estate. <laughs> Victoria Fernandez across Crossmark coming up very shortly. We're going to turn our attention to the earnings still to come after the close from Netflix, from Tesla, and some housing data about 34 minutes away from New York City. This is Bloomberg. data is kind of starting to show us that maybe we won't have that recession. Businesses have been remarkably resilient. If the economy continues to actually chug along here, we avoid a recession. I think we're heading back towards a 2% sort of era. Unless we get more loosening in the labor market, it's hard for us to see that inflation durably, sustainably comes back to 2%. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramlitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. I guess we're done bank earnings. No, we're not. Much more to come across the regional space and the bank Netflix reporting this afternoon. John, you alluded to this earlier. Thank God the big banks are over. Now we go on to real America. Yeah, can we talk about Netflix? Let's talk about yeah. Netflix. <laughs> Crackdown on password sharing. They've already led us to believe that subs are going to be up off the back of this. We'll see what right. the number actually looks like. A lot of people think that's been discounted in the stock. The name is up by something like 60% year to date. You've also got these strikes, Tom. What does the catalogue look like over at Netflix? <clears throat> 
How can they retain their audience, the eyeballs, for the next 12 months if this continues? There are some analysts, I'll talk to one a little bit later, who believe right. that this network, Netflix, this company, is best positioned to handle this. I look at the log chart and on the rebound off the pandemic and the recovery here, as you mentioned, the password, are they going to have a more persistent cash flow and all that? Maybe they're closest to getting back on trend of all the beleaguered media business. You know, I, I think maybe they're, they're, making they're, money just, they're making money. They're making yeah. money. And the challenge is for a lot of people that got into this business, I'm thinking Disney Plus, thinking right. others too, who were chasing subs. Can they do the same thing? They've been cutting back some of those other names. Well, so it looks like Netflix is on top. And I think you see that captured in the name so far this year. I wanted to dive into the Barbie hysteria right now, but we're not going to do that too important in our Victoria Fernandez joining with us here uh, in a moment. But the bottom line is, John, is earning season out in bulls reaffirming. To me, the headline was Jonathan Golub at Credit Suisse, a bull lifting ever higher. 4,700. Earning season for me, Tom, starts next week. This year has been dominated by big tech, the big seven. They start to report earnings next week. Tesla, I know, a little bit later. But next week, when you get Alphabet, Meta, Microsoft, yeah. and onto Apple in early August, totally agree. that's going to define earnings season for a lot of people, <clears throat> particularly if you were in those names so far, Tom, in 23. Lisa, your thoughts here on it, and take it to the credit. Amanda Lyman was just brilliant, I thought, there on slicing and dicing this. What does credit say about our equity bullishness? Well, I think right now what you're seeing broadly is a risk on feel. The question is, what are the fundamentals and where do they start to bite a little bit more, especially as we see some of the big bank earnings demonstrate that restraint in lending? And she was talking about how we could get a default cycle even if we don't get a recession. There will be companies that will have a difficult time paying back their bills, refinancing, cutting their debt loads, akin to what Carvana is trying to do this morning or achieving that. But, you know, on a broader level, this speaks to the near term, potentially momentum continuing, and the longer term, at some point, fundamentals matter. Can I point out that 4,700, one year out from now, is up 4%? I mean, that's how it sounded careful super we are, bullish a few months you know, ago. And uber not super so much bullish, now. and we've come so far. You know, it, 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 to be fair to John Golub, he's been killing it, but it's a tweak. It's a tweak. Yeah. Biggie Chad at Deutsche Bank with me, Tom, 930. Got nothing else to say. That's just my tease. That's <laughs> just, just get out for anything. If you want an else? equity market ball. Anybody I mean, else on the show? Exactly Anybody yeah. else on the show? Today? Funnier people. I'll tease them later. Oh, you'll do it. Yeah. Right. Right. That's the tease but, of the tease. But, I mean, Lisa, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to understand that the bond world is out front of the equity world. And I think what I've heard is it's pretty quiescent here on defaults, fear, gloom. No, except commercial real estate. Well, I think, look, there, there are a lot of issues here. There's a granularity <laughs> of perhaps private credit markets having the same dynamics that the high-yield bond market used to have and some of the distress more apparent there, this according to some people, on a larger sense. And this is what we heard from Anna Hahn earlier. We have seen the fundamentals yeah. come in not so strong. People look past that because they see their 401k is getting bigger. They see what their uh, money is doing in the stock market. They're like, let's go. We're happy. They keep yeah. buying. And how long can that continue regardless of what we get in earnings? Well, VIX, 13.34 is, come on, we're happy. That's a pretty good number. It's a bull market, John. It is a bull market. Or is it? Some people still think this is a bear market rally. Do a data check you for Pinky Chatter. Some the next people hour. still yeah. think... Morgan Stanley, Mike Wilson still believe this is a bear market rally. And even the bear, I mean, we mentioned BNP Paribas, Daniel Morris, there. Greg Bowdle, very cautious. Greg Bowdle's even more Paribas. cautious, yeah. yeah, and has been yeah. for a while. Equities unchanged on the S&P, bonds with a bid. We're rallying here on treasuries, on gilts, inflation softer in the UK. Yield to lower by three or four basis points on a 10-year in the US, 374.63. <clears> it's onwards to housing data, Tom, in 25 minutes. It's going to be interesting to see right now to join us, Victoria Fernandez, Chief Market Strategist at Crossmark Global Investments, and the charm here is twofold. One is she is living the heat wave across our heat dome in the southwest, and two, she's got a heat dome of her own of clients who were afraid and missed this equity market. Let's go to Abilene 106 to begin with, Victoria. What is the actual anecdote you see off this horrific heat wave in your Texas? Yeah, look, it is it is killing it here when it comes to the heat. We are super hot down here, and I guess you can relate that somehow when you look at utility stocks and what's going on with ERCOT down here um, in Houston. 
with the Texas grid and what's going on there, you can relate it to the energy sector. But I also think you can look at the hotness that we're seeing in the equity market right now. You know, I have been much more cautious on the market than a lot of people have as of late. I look at what's going on in the market and I can say, yes, I see this bullish momentum, right? It's the momentum factors, the price factors that are leading this equity market right now. And you have to take advantage of that in some way. But the interesting part is we see this momentum and then we look at all of these red flags that are flashing in the market as well and say, how do we combine these two things to have some risk management for our clients while still taking advantage of the heat wave in the market? Let's pick a name. Netflix, up 61% year-to-date reports earnings later. Victoria, what do you do with a name like Netflix with performance like that? Yeah, these names that have run up so much this year, I think you do have to be a little bit cautious here. You talked earlier about some of the, the increase in subs because of the password sharing going away, that that's been priced into the stock. And we saw a jump in the stock price on that previously. So listen to some other elements that are coming out. Let's hear what they're saying about advertising. What are the um, subscribers that are using the ad-based component? What is that looking like? Are you seeing some of the subscribers coming on to the lower priced um, components? Or are you still getting some of the higher priced in there? What does that look like? And look, if you're going to have a strike, if you're going to have an actor strike and a writer strike, You've said it before, Netflix is well positioned to kind of go through that because they have a lot of international exposure. I mean, I'll watch a foreign film with subtitles. I'm okay with that if there's nothing else on TV. So I think Netflix can ride through that a little bit, but be cautious if you don't own it yet. I think you can tweak your position depending on what happens with earnings this afternoon, uh, but I'm not sure I would go all in on the name at this point. Wait for a pullback if you don't have it already. So as everybody does get this sort of euphoria that we've been hearing about about how are you navigating you don't want to get out of the market but it sounds like you are shifting away from some of the big tech names into some of the more defensive areas how much have you been doing that over the past few weeks we've been doing it quite a bit lisa i mean we have been a much more cautious i'd say than the market has been itself because of these red flags i mentioned a moment ago you look at leading economic indicators down 14 months in a row you look at the inverted yield curve and and the starting to see it steepen a little bit, that's actually your signal historically of recession coming. There's a lot of these elements that are out there that are telling you recession could be there. But the support that you're seeing in the market, high beta versus low beta, industrials versus utilities, is telling you there's still some momentum there. So, yes, we have some cyclicality in the portfolio. We have tech names, Lisa. We're just not buying some of those high-flying names that you guys were talking about that are going to start reporting earnings. We're buying names like Adobe. We're buying names like Oracle. But we're also going in and having some of those more staple names. Grocery stores like Kroger. You've seen grocery prices come down a little bit. People are buying more groceries, so Kroger's a good name. General Mills. You see some of these that have been hit in the staple sector. I think you can go in and pick some of these names up and give a buffer to your portfolio because we do think it's still going to be really choppy, and we're not taking a recession out of the cards 100% at this point. Where do bonds fit into this, Victoria, especially as we were just talking with Amanda Lynham of BlackRock, who said we are going to see a default cycle even if we don't necessarily get recession. Yeah, we've seen some of the lower investment grade names. We uh, Not necessarily that their defaults are going higher, but the leverage components are going higher um, in some of those names. And so you want to be careful and watch that. We wouldn't be in high yield, which I believe is what she said as well. I think you're um, playing a little too risky if you do that with the thought that we do think there still could be a mild recession later this year. But credit has a place in your portfolio. You can lock in some yield right now. We've seen the shorter part of the curve come down a little bit as expectations of the terminal rate has dropped about, what, 20, 25 basis points over the last few weeks. But you can still lock in a 475, a 5% on the short end of the curve, catch that coupon. There's no reason not to do that. And couple that with something a little bit longer out the curve, add that little bit of duration in your portfolio, because if yields have peaked, at that four and a quarter or so for this cycle, then you want to have some longer duration and take advantage of yields coming down in 2024. They're coming down this morning in 23, that's for sure. Victoria Fernandez across Smart Global Investments, thank you. It's been a year of pain trades in 2023. Yeah. One of them, I have to say, is in credit, Lisa. High yield credit spreads, still near the tights of the year. 
at 379. We were They're going to be talking 400? about... Yeah, I didn't know that. 380. Yeah. South of 380 now. Lisa, we were talking about going through 550 on Fed funds right. and the pain that would come, the default cycle that would begin and what would happen to credit spreads that get wider as we went into recession. And now people are talking about no recession all over again. And even if they talk about recession, then they say, well, there just hasn't been any issuance. No, by the way, the issuers are even better quality, so it doesn't really matter. And at what point do we start to see high yields lead and give a sense of some of the credit distress that everyone's been talking there you about go. for the That's past the year? That's the Bramogloom. That's what we didn't take much encouragement. Did, 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 just, you just know, have you to go, go to high spreads yield. And, <laughs> spreads and <laughs> Bloom and Bramos, oh, Bramos, Bramos it's, it's all over. For uh, what I would say is, given this bull market and the wonderful presentation by Victoria, is the I don't understand the level of fear of missing out right now. I, I just wonder how to gauge the fury of people that they didn't know Netflix back when Queen's Gambit was number one. Netflix no. going in one direction. I never Just, watched that, you know. I didn't oh, watch it's very it. good. Yeah, check that it's, out. It's one of the few things. What about foreign movies, watched. subtitles? You into that? Check out Cinema Paradiso. You'd love that movie from the late 80s. I'm into the, those Great movie. Of, yeah, oh, yeah. you'd like that from the late 80s. Okay. You know, it's a really, really, just a nice story in a nice fictional town in Sicily. It's beautiful. Where okay. you want to live. <laughs> yeah, you know. It's a sensitive thing. <laughs> if it's too hot over in Phoenix, I'm told it's too hot and people oh, are standing. It's brutal. You know. It's hot in the summer in Phoenix. If you're just joining the program, welcome to the program on the S&P 500 futures, positive by zero. <laughs> Say that with a zero. One percent. Coming up in about 20 minutes' time, we'll get you some housing data. This is the latest from City. Softer than expected UK inflation will keep markets optimistic. The resilient US growth can coexist with global inflation slowdown. But housing data this morning may serve as a reminder of ongoing supply-demand imbalances and remaining inflationary pressure. Andrew Hollenhorst of City. I'm looking forward to Neil Dutt of Renaissance Macro on the housing market, mm -hmm. TK. You've got him coming up at 8.30 Eastern time, so just after that data drops. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. And what I, what I learned this week, and maybe it was 10 days ago, is I looked at the relative size of four or five states. And the real estate market of New York, Florida, California, and such is totally different than everything else. I mean, it's not homogenous in any way, shape, or form. You wanted to say something on Phoenix? Well, no, I, just, I, I think you just think it's always hot in Phoenix, but now it's well, really no, it is. hot. I know it it's really record. hot. It's really hot. But you're just you're like, hot. you could even say that you're saying because evidently it's It's hot record hot. It is record hot. It's incredibly hot. hot. It's just they're, they're painting that you've seen the weather charts now. Oh, yeah, all the, the time. TV. They're like yeah, painting yeah. them like red. So red it's purple. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah, like, like all red around. But it's true. I mean, it's intense. You see this kind of network and cable, these media groups still having that pull. We thought that might be that sweet balance. That was one of our largest calls. And right now, as we see it, we've stepped off that pullback call. Well, you know, we'll throw in the towel, we'll admit ourselves on that one. But something we're still watching here is, you know, what is going to be the pace of this rally in the back half this year? And can this AI and really Uber top-led rally continue? I think that's what's really weighing on people's minds. It's a number one question for a lot of people in the equity market. Anna Hand there, equity strategist at Wells Fargo Securities, do the winners keep winning or does this rally start to broaden out beyond the mega cap, Uber cap, tech Uber cap, led names like on see, the S&P 500? See if they lift. Once you go through one trillion, it's it's no longer big cap, is it? I'm not even sure mega cap gets it I, done I, anymore. It's like, you know, it's just it's like un, unheard of. Nano cap. Yeah, we want to go with yeah, that. It's, like, yeah. Whatever. it's called the index. Take, take your pick. It, it is called the index. <laughs> That's exactly right. where we're at. That's nice. The S&P 500 futures just about positive, turning positive in the last couple of moments. In about 13 minutes, we'll get some economic data, housing data, and then you're opening bell. Tom, an hour after that. Right now, we're going to dive into this, folks. This is important. And we're, again, we're coming up on the serious housing data, which we'll, we'll give you good coverage on. And that is the surrealness of the moment in the world of Mandeep Singh. He is senior surreal analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence, dealing with AI, dealing with the silly valuations right now. And just as one idea, Mandeep, with the Microsoft's uh, melt up yesterday that we saw at the new highs, they're heavily burdened by 3.1% long-term debt. They have a weight to cost and weighted average cost of capital of debt of 0.1%. I haven't even looked at free cash flow generation other than gajillions. And I can just see them. Is it in Redmond where their offices are still? Are they still in yes. Redmond? They're in Redmond screaming, we got to get to three trillion market cap by August 1. We got to catch up. Is there that competition between Microsoft 
an apple to get bigger, better, and all that? Is that tangible, or are they two separate worlds? They are separate in the sense Microsoft is coming at it uh, from the enterprise side. Apple obviously is heavily consumer focused. And right now, I think everyone, even though they're focused on AI, my, what Microsoft has done yesterday is said that AI is just not a feature. We can monetize it with a product. And they're talking about a $30 subscription on top of what they're selling with their office suite. That's huge. I'm. I'm sure they've done some due diligence in terms of figuring out the pricing around it because for a new product like that to be priced at such a high point, that's telling you something that they're confident that this will resonate at the enterprise level. We're speaking with Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence ahead of the beginning, the sort of inception of the earnings kickoff for big tech, which will happen after the bell today. We're going to get IBM. We're going to get Netflix. And how much are we going to learn about where the bar is set and whether it's too high or too low? I think the incremental revisions, the positive ones, are going to come from the companies that can monetize this generative AI wave. And look, expectations have gone up. But what Microsoft said yesterday is we could generate almost 30 to $40 billion in incremental revenue over the next two years. That's huge. That's not in the consensus numbers. So that's where you have to be selective with companies. I don't think every company can do it. I mean, uh, you have to go to the semiconductor makers or the software providers that are at the cutting edge when it comes to monetizing it. So are you saying that you suspect that people are overpricing the monetary boon that will come from AI and how democratic it will be spread? Well, so right now, everyone is talking about AI. You listen to any earnings call, any management team, they're talking about AI. In terms of what it does to your uh, top line or profitability, that's what you got to figure out. We know these workloads are expensive. It's going to raise your infrastructure costs. Can you monetize it? And that's where I think there is some gross margin offset. But as long as you can do what Microsoft <clears throat> said yesterday, they are looking to monetize. That's huge. That's all, uh, you know, 40% incremental margin. And, and that's uh, what the street is looking for in terms of driving these positive revisions. What is the sustainability of a Microsoft double-digit revenue growth. I say this as I look at 10% five-year dividend growth. I'm looking at a ginormous multiple. It's not like luxury or that, but it's a stupid multiple to be direct. But are people just modeling in AI, non-AI? I don't really don't care about AI, but are they modeling in double-digit revenue growth for the Mandeep Singh world? Well, as of right now, you see these companies are expected to grow at 10, 12% top line. Right. And uh, call that the, revenue growth. The, the AI Thank contribution you. isn't there. So that's in line with the <clears throat> software spending. And, and that's where, you know, it is a zero sum game in the sense if Microsoft is able to pull off 20% plus growth. That's coming at the expense of something. If generative AI is driving 40% yeah, growth. Simple, on a simple basis, yeah. if I go 10, 10, 10, 36 months out, I'm up 30% in revenue growth. Do you model that in your world? Well, so again, you, you have to look at how the software spending grows. Historically, it has grown around 10%, and Microsoft is growing in line with the long-term growth rates in the software sector. Now, if they're growing 20%, that's coming at somebody's expense. And you can already see that legacy to uh, on, uh, like cloud shift. Now this is going to probably speed up in the sense I mean, people are going to invest in digital transformation initiatives. They did that yeah. post-COVID. That's going to take to a new level in terms of what they could do with AI. Lisa, Adobe's trading at an LVMH model. It's like they're moving leather goods in Paris or something. I mean, it's, it's, Mandeep's world is nuts. It's probably more lucrative than that at this point. Mandeep, I do want to just end with a quick note on Tesla because they are reporting earnings after the bell. And we have seen this cut in pricing over at Ford. How much is some of the demand for EVs as luxury vehicles and at that price point, how much is that really coming off? Well, again, everyone is thinking Tesla is not just an EV maker, but there is an autonomous driving element to it. And that's what's driving the valuation. Look, generative AI is built around proprietary data and what you could do in terms of automation and stuff like that. And, and Tesla, to an extent, was early in terms of thinking about that kind of model. Whether that helps them, you know, roll out their uh, FSD software to the entire install base, that remains to be seen. But we we know people have paid fifteen thousand dollars for that FSD software, and if they can uh, kind of expand that, that would be a huge high margin business for them.
Keep an eye on Formula One. Not because of Netflix. See what they can do with a hyper efficient engine with sustainable fuels. And let's see if they back away from a hybrid engine. Then I wonder what's going to happen to the auto industry. That's why I'd be watching Formula One over the next couple of years. I think it's going to be really interesting. That's the only reason why you watch I, that. Not just that, but I think it's, it's very John. interesting from an industrial policy perspective what all these administrations, all these governments worldwide are doing right now. I think it's arguably very good for economic growth. They get all that, fantastic for employment. But how much these companies spend to invest in electrifying you. their 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 manufacturing lines, Tom, and to come up with these EVs, and then what happens in five to ten years if we come up with something better? You have been, John, we'll way see. out front on this. You know, you could do a job swap and work for Mandeep Singh's. Uh, I don't think Mandeep's team it, team it, on it, that. I could just see John Farrell <laughs> down there. You've been way out front on this. I've really been thinking about it off your comments, and I go back to the Detroit International Auto Show. It's got to be twelve years ago with Ken Pruitt, and the head of Mercedes there said to me, Tom only hybrid will win. And he was heated about it, that all EV, they can't figure out how to do it. We get where the government wants to go. I understand that, and that's a very powerful thing. But what the engineers come up with, I think it's going to be pretty interesting in the next five years. Especially with the national security overlay, given the fact that a lot of the materials that are oh, go I, into I, these batteries so come from China. So there's a question well, I, about who the winners, who the losers are, and then what the alternatives are that get discovered in this process, to your point, the takeover of that industry. You know, they'll be testing it with David Ricardo. I think it's going to be great. I mean, it's really <laughs> going to be important in Alpha Tori, what they do with, with Daniel. Daniel, sorry. <laughs> you know, it's really I bad. Missed I just missed the noise, I missed the sound. Missed the sound. Mandeep, thank you. Mandeep, Mandeep like, why the hell? Are you here? <laughs> Appreciate that it. That was great on Microsoft. Really, really interesting. Coming up really next hour, Subhadra Jappa, George Bori. Looking forward to that from Salt oh, Jenner Binky. or Spring, respectively. Binky Chatter around the yeah, opening bell great. of Deutsche Bank. And then we're going to be speaking about Netflix and the earnings still to come with Alan Gold of Loop Capital Markets. Manager director over there, Tom. So that's going to be fun. Equities on the SP just about unchanged. You're opening bell one hour away. Up shortly, housing data. Absolutely oh, brilliant. Dude. Neil Dutta of Renaissance AI Macro. and housing. Well, Bloomberg surveillance, job claims tomorrow, but today housing starts, housing permits. All that kind of stuff with red and green on the screen. The VIX 13.35. Yields are lower. The yields are coming a little bit. Of note, 10-year, 3.74%. And the two-year note, 4.1% uh, is well. Brent crude, importantly, over 80. There's sort of a looser feel to the market today. Lisa Bramowitz and Tom Keenan with us. Joining us, an expert at America's housing economy, Michael McKee. Michael, data this morning. Data this morning. And this one comes out on time. Uh, housing starts drop significantly 8%. Of course, that follows a 22% rise the prior month in May. So average it out, and it isn't all that bad. But uh, the expectation was for a 9.3% decline. Building permits are down 3.7%. They were up 5.6% in May. So kind of average that out. Uh, we have a revision to that May figure for housing starts here, 15.7% uh, instead of 217 But basically what we're seeing is a healthy right. home building market. There was a, I noticed um, this morning, there was a study out from Redfin that said 91.8% of Americans have a mortgage under 6%. Yes, and 70% under, under 5 And yeah, so nobody yeah. is selling their existing home. So the right. thing you got to do is buy a new home, and they're building yeah. them pretty much as fast as they can get. You look at the uh, statistics for how many people are employed in construction, and it's not keeping up with the business they're doing. So um, that that's a limiting factor. It's mortgage rates a limiting factor. I mean, if we get disinflation, I guess mortgage rates come down. But where they are right now into the autumn, are they a limiting factor? Oh, they're definitely a limiting factor. Uh, they're a limiting factor on house. the existing home side. So that pushes people. Oop, I'm pushing my microphone. Uh, new? That that you know, pushes okay. people into the uh, into the new home market. Well, and that's the reason why I find it interesting that in some ways the home builder stats are a direct outcropping of the mortgage rates as they are. We are seeing a slight tick up, at least in the mortgage applications earlier today. How far? 
can they go with this? How strong is the demand and at what price, right? I mean, how much are we seeing the disinflationary effect of some of the materials really spur the activity that we keep getting in the home building sector? I don't think it's so much disinflation. Uh, the, a lot of the home builders were buying down your mortgage to try to get you to sign a contract. Uh, I understand that's easing up a little bit, but you could get in the fours uh, not too long ago, uh, concessions from the home builders. Uh, you're right, the price of uh, construction materials has come down. That helps the builders, and maybe that helps you get a little bit more in your <clears throat> home. But this has kept uh, some parts of the economy afloat, uh, appliances yeah. and electronics yeah. and furniture. We saw uh, big gains yesterday in the retail sales report, and that's one reason why. Turn to the market right now. I'm not going to say much going on. The two-year yield, 4.70%, in a little bit, six uh, basis points. Before I leave you, Michael, you're back from Rocky Mountain. We could talk economics there. But in honor of the late, great Ken Pruitt, who helped us invent uh, uh, he was a, uh, invent Bloomberg surveillance. Ken Pruitt was a great fisherman, and you have the mother of all fishing stories. To use the phrase from <laughs> Ken, you caught a trout the size of your leg. What'd you capture <laughs> out there? You went uh, hunting for a fish. It was it was the last fish I caught, and it was 28 <laughs> inches a rainbow trout. And so it's it, bigger than two it, feet. It, it it yes, it was big, uh, and it snapped the rod when I was trying to land it, and. I managed to Did it bite it, you? I mean, no. you know, what were you <laughs> fishing? Is generally like, don't bite. Did you take the Ellen Zentner School of Trout Fishing? Is that how you do oh, this? Oh, yeah. So, it was fly fishing. Out in, fly fishing? Yeah. Could you see, how come we don't have a life like he has? He's fly fishing in the Rocky there's, Mountains. There, there's a rumor I, I that you're going out to Jackson <laughs> Hole later this year and, <clears> and, and going to take fishing lessons. And there's no so. way. Grandma, are you going to take fishing lessons? Sure, I Jackson? would take fishing You went canoeing home. last That's year. That's right. I yeah. would take fishing classes. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? We'll get everybody out there to fish. Get about get us. Thank you so much with our economic data uh, today. Right now, and this is important here, with green on the screen, nice a little fractional lift of the market. For those of you gloomy, this is the interview of the day. There have been optimists. They are congenital optimists, and they're also reasoned optimists. And one of them is Neil Dutta. He's out of U.S. Economic Research at Renaissance Macro and has been extraordinary, not over the last three months, six months, but frankly the last two years of saying this is America the resilient. The Dutta chart is out there, Neil. And it is finally, we have legitimate real income growth. Will we sustain that? I believe so, Tom. Thanks for having me on. Um, obviously, there's a lot of uh, disinflation in the pipeline, at least over the next, uh, you know, you could say three to four months. Um, the most obvious is used cars. Uh, we know that uh, wholesale auction prices have been coming down. That's going to bleed into consumer prices for used cars and trucks. Uh, supply chains are improving. That's going to um, take some pressure off of core goods outside of vehicles. Uh, and there's still some disinflation in train with respect to shelter, looking at new lease growth. At the same time, we know the labor markets are holding up, and uh, that's going to uh, support uh, real incomes. And if real incomes are rising, Mm -hmm. you know, ultimately, I think consumers are going to go out and spend that money. So I think that's sort of the linchpin for... Uh, for why things are holding up better than expected. Atlanta has a GDP now numbers. We came in at a 2% statistic Q1, and all of a sudden we're migrating 1.82-ish uh, on Atlanta GDP, whatever it is. I really don't care what the number is. But my question is, to the gloom, what statistic of positive GDP in America is a so-called growth recession? Is it half a percent, 0.5? Do you have a, that number in your head? Well, I, I would define a growth recession as a situation where the economy is um, has a you know the GDP has a positive sign in front of it, but that growth is not strong enough to keep the unemployment rate from rising. So typically in a growth recession, you'd see the unemployment rate go up. So it's effectively a below potential growth state, uh, Tom. But that's not what we have right now. I mean, you mentioned the Atlanta Fed. Uh, that that number is tracking 2.4 percent. Um, you know, with very little contribution from consumer spending, I suspect that probably builds over the summer, frankly. But um, wow. Um, but you know, look, um, you know, there's more upside to the economy um, than not. But we're growing above potential, well, and uh, you know that means that whatever unemployment rate increase you see, sort of bobbing around three and a half percent, I mean, it's probably going to be short-lived. We're not on a situation where we're going to see above four percent unemployment. 
Goldilocks seems to be uh, the moment that we're in. That's what a lot of people are saying. How long can Goldilocks last? I mean, talk to me in the fall, Lisa. I mean, that's what that's what I'll say. I mean, I think All it's. Right. I, I, I'm sort of I'm sort of in the Goldilocks for now camp. I mean, I do think that um, there are reasons to be uh, somewhat uh, suspicious about how long this can last, about whether this is a durable sort of sustainable uh, moderation in inflation. I think that's a uh, a question that needs to be answered. I don't think we can answer it just yet. Um, but you know, to me, when you think about economic scenarios, I think the risk of recession has receded dramatically. And so now it's a question for investors about where do you put those other percentages, right? I mean, do you, I mean, I think the markets are right to kind of allocate a little bit more to the soft landing story. But um, I, I, I think, you know, you could, I, I think you can make a good case that maybe we're getting a little bit over our skis here. And we should probably put some more potential on the resurgence of the inflationary boom scenario. Okay, well, um, I, I wanted you to double down on that because you were just saying that people are, are perhaps a little too sanguine about the steady disinflation that they expect to see. Where is it that you see reinflation coming back down the pike, especially if you hear all these people saying that Fed policy hasn't worked its way through the financial system and still has more restraining to do? Well, home prices are rising, and they're actually rising for the for four months in a row. Uh, we get weekly data from Redfin, and um, you know that's more up to date, uh, and that shows continued increases in home prices over the summer, even after seasonal adjustments. So, you know, to the extent that home prices go up, and uh, you know, obviously, if you're a landlord and the underlying value of your asset is rising, you're not going to go around saying, "Yep, I'm going to start cutting your rent." Uh, so, it, it it leads me to believe that we could see some uh, upward momentum in. Um, in housing rental inflation in the CPI statistics sometime, uh, you know, let's say in the first or second quarter of next year. So that would be the most obvious area. But, you know, more broadly, I mean, let's take a step back and, you know, what are we talking about here? We're talking about real growth improving. Real growth is improving. Over time, that, that erodes physical capacity and that forces economic actors to bid up wages and prices. So yeah, um, yeah I, I just I, I have a little bit of skepticism in terms of how far we can push this kind of immaculate disinflation story. Just real um, quick here, Neil, given that, sorry. how far do you think the Fed could go? I mean, do you think that people are pricing out future rate hikes after this month and that that's inaccurate, that you think that that's wrong? Uh, I mean, who am I to say what's right and what's wrong? <laughs> but I would just if, I, if it were me, I mean, I think the probabilities of a hike um, you know, after July are probably somewhat higher than the markets are currently expecting. Neil Dutta, thanks so much. We've got major breaking news. We're going to have to run off. But Neil Dutta, they're extraordinary on this 2% American uh, real uh, GDP. He is with Renaissance Macro as well. Our timing was a bit off. We had Mandeep Singh half an hour ago. We were doing uh, giggles about more Microsoft. But here are the headlines. This is off the Activision Blizzard earnings uh, announcement. And Lisa, it's a set of headlines that gives you an intraday lift to Microsoft and it's fractional, but that's off the melt up yesterday. I'm going to clock it now at 361 per share at about a 5% lift since about 10 a.m. yesterday. The acquisition of Activision Blizzard has been uh, held up in a bunch of litigation and other regulatory concerns, a question around whether it will get ex uh, executed or not. Activision Blizzard giving Microsoft more time to complete the $69 billion merger. That's the latest news, prompting a leg higher just slightly in pre-market trading. They're extending the deadline to October 18th. Uh, and so they're going to also— It's a good uh, amount of time. You it's know, a, I, yeah, but you know. also in, in return for this, Microsoft— agreed to a higher termination fee and some new commercial agreements. So trying to kick the can as they uh, work through some and of the I, regulatory I, issues. I, I, yeah, well, the regulatory issues, I wonder how we see and in what way we receive a response from the government, in this, given the travails the government has had in the last uh, number of days. I'm colored by this. I don't think clearly on this. I, the, I was with Bloomberg. I have the clearest memories of just one headline slipping out on a lazy day, 10 a.m., 2 p.m., you know, I was worried about what was in the food court, said government drops all actions against Microsoft or whatever it was. I mean, the whole government 
angst and all that, and then all of a sudden they go. Uh, they haven't been very successful not. with their antitrust yeah. pushes, and that's been something that uh, Linda Kahn <clears throat> has been a bit well, concerned about. Uh, I know a lot of pushback from the uh, from Congress. Microsoft, then again, into the Netflix uh, earnings this afternoon. The Standard and Poor's 500 near flat, up one tenth of a percent. After the bell today, we get Netflix earnings as well as Tesla kicking off some of oh, the big Tesla. tech earnings. Yeah, and this to me is going to be interesting, uh, especially given the run-up that we've seen in Tesla in particular, but also Netflix shares. This is the big test. John was referring to this, that yes, big bank earnings kick off the season, but the meat is going to be in tech names as they either deliver or not after all these expectations. It's, it's a cross-section, and I, I think the dispersion of businesses, of the way the income statement looks, the balance sheet looks, in tech is far greater than in banking, and that's to say that Goldman Sachs is a very different platform than J.P. Morgan. I think, my, you know, as, as Mandeep said, Microsoft is in enterprise world and Apple's in the retail world, so to conflate them all together, I think, is really unfortunate. We'll it's, it's, avoid that. it's a good point. Uh, but in terms <clears throat> of returns, you can conflate them a little bit, albeit at a different oh, yeah, scale. Netflix shares up 61 percent year to date. Tesla shares up yeah. a cool 138 yeah. percent year to date. Just to give you a sense of, you know, the incredible roar that we've heard. And I mean, nothing it, is just a car company. It's 361 anymore. shares. I'm looking at six, seven shares, I think, as a first purchase of Microsoft annualized return over the last decade of, I don't think I should be in there. Uh, Bill Gates is not involved anymore. I think I shouldn't buy it. 29.3% per yeah. year. Well, uh, how do you what price innovation? How do you price market dominance? How do you price getting out ahead of trends that have to be adopted by I, companies around the world? A chart out, uh, I'm going to give credit to J.P. Morgan 10 days ago or so on how much money you've lost by not being in the market. By not participating, it is jaw-dropping. Futures up two, Dow futures up five. We quote the Dow for John Farrow. Stay with us. From New York on radio and television, this is Bloomberg. When you look at investment banking, trading, advisory, yep. when do they come back and how robust will that activity be? Well, I think, I don't know when exactly. Uh, I do believe it's bottomed. I think deal, deals will start getting done. Whether they happen in the back half of this year, I'm not so sure. It might be, it might be next year that it comes, but it'll definitely be, it will be during next year when we see it, if not this year. James Gorman, and we say good morning to all of you, of Morgan Stanley there, the success of his wealth management effort, and much other than Morgan Stanley, uh, with our Chanelli Bassett this morning. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keene here. Uh, on a Wednesday, yes, there's economics. The housing data that came out, I'm going to call it a percolation to the market, is pretty much uh, what we see uh, right now. I should my Bitcoin under 30,000 is a topic for the 10 a.m. Uh, hour. Uh, futures red and green on the screen, the VIX 13.30. Right now, we're going to have a conversation that we did not have with Shanali Basak and Allison Williams. They are in the heat of the earnings coming out, the numbers, the PowerPoint, and the ratios. But with Sri Natarajan of Bloomberg News, we can sit back and actually look at the discussion that's being um, had. Sri, I'm looking at a board. I'm going to go all William Cohen on you here. David Vinier, who lived 2007, 2008. Peter Oppenheimer, who we talked to all the time. Kimberly Harris, a new board member, Kevin Johnson. What's the spirit of the board if they look? And it's it's too much to say the train wreck, but just simply the tension and complexity of the underperformance of Goldman Sachs. How's the board respond? And don't forget the new incoming board member, Tom Montag, at Goldman Sachs for over two decades, then at Bank of America, now returning to Goldman Sachs in what the What will be role. the response of the board? I think they will tell you that the stock does not fall off a cliff. They're okay. They're not getting antsy because over the last five years since David Solomon took the seat October 1, 2018 to today, Goldman's stock has done well. They will tell you they've done extraordinarily well. The reality is they're middle of the pack. And middle of the pack is not a crisis. Uh, this is critical now. And I'm thinking of David Vinier. I, I have the clearest memories of him and I going back and forth on the library, OIS, August of 07. And he had that huge responsibility uh, running the ship, essentially, financially at Goldman Sachs. 
the mem the collective memory on the board at Goldman Sachs, including Mr. Montag, how do they respond to this? Is there like sharp words or is it like a McKinsey meeting where everybody's planning in a complex way to move forward? I think reality is no one on the board is going to be very comfortable seeing all the noise and the headlines coming out of Goldman Sachs. But what they ultimately want to see is stock performance. They want to see that they're on target to achieve some of the goals they've set out. There's obviously been strategy turnaround, some 180s they've done on their retail banking strategy, but they have committed to a new, new, new strategy. As long as they can deliver on that, the board will be content and okay. It doesn't look like anyone on the board is thirsting to make a change right about now. Where's the growth going to come from in the new, 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 new strategy? Well, that's important. A lot of analysts, uh, some of the analysts at least, have called this a kitchen sink quarter. Try and throw out all the bad stuff mm. in this quarter because the numbers are really bad. Return on equity, 4%. How does that compare to some of the peers? It's the worst among the big banks. You have JP Morgan posting 20% return on equity. So that's not good. And you've had a few consecutive quarters of Goldman missing on its profitability goal, which is a mid-teens ROE. So the question is, where does the growth come from? You know, and we heard James Gorman talk about this yesterday. Gorman said investment banking, the trough in investment banking has arrived. It's going to look up going forward. When, that, when capital markets reopen, when deal making goes up again, you can be rest assured that Goldman will be in a good place. And they will look to point out the increasing durable revenue growth in their asset management business. It seems as though the banks that are most diversified and largest have been benefiting the most from the recent enthusiasm, at least over the past few weeks, of bank shares. How is Goldman going to try to appeal to this? Or are they going to say, no, we essentially are a niche markets-focused bank. We tried our foray into consumer banking. It didn't work. No, they'll certainly not say that. They tried a different tack. They said we're very, we're a very good investment bank in trading and banking, but we're going to expand into retail banking. We'll make that as good as our investment banking franchise. That clearly didn't happen. You wasted a few years going deep into that space and now trying to retreat. But now they're talking about the two pillars, the investment bank and the asset and wealth management business. And that is the one right. place that they can hope to show growth going forward. You call it there, I think it was page six of the, of the presentation very clearly laid out, commercial real estate has challenges. What is their uniqueness in commercial real estate versus the other major banks? Quite, uh, quite a few important things, right? Investments where they have operational control, they're mostly tied to commercial real estate, about $10 billion of investment there. They took a half a billion dollar hit there. They have equity investments, a lot of it through principal investment. Like using a skyscraper their balance in Singapore, sheet. just as a generalization? From, from offices to warehouses and everything else that falls under the commercial real estate rubric. They have about $28 billion in loans in the commercial real estate space. So that's about 15% of their total loan portfolio. So they've taken some hits there. They've taken hits on the equity investments and also on what they call their consolidated investments. That's contributed to about a billion dollar hit this quarter. Their hope will be they're not taking any more write downs going ahead. And that's really important for them and not entirely in their control as well. Headcount has gone down by about 5%, I believe, based on the latest uh, assessment. How much more does it have to fall? 5% uh, year to date, 8% is probably another figure to look at because that's year on year, doesn't include the new uh, analyst batch intake. One would think that they've done the biggest exercises needed. They haven't come out and explicitly said that. And if they do need to take more action, that tells you there's a lot more uh, bad news to come out of there. So they will certainly be hoping that they do not have to take any more headcount actions. They've already done three different rounds <clears throat> in the last year, and that doesn't show great management, frankly. Just taking a step back, we did just wrap up the earnings cycle in the big banks, and it seems as though the themes are deposits cost something, particularly if you're a smaller bank, credit is contracting on the margins, and credit cards are the sweet spot. How would you wrap that together to push it forward and say where this is going for the next quarter? Yes, all of those points are true. Credit is perhaps contracting. But look at the commentary that we've gotten from some of the big consumer banks. Look at what JP Morgan kept telling us. Uh, charge off rates are going up. It'll probably end the year at 2.6% on their credit card portfolio. They keep repeating, this is a normalization, mm. not deterioration. This is normalization right. post the pandemic. They're not that concerned. So if you zoom out, the economy right. is not as bad, or at least the trajectory does not appear to be right. as bad as three or four months ago. So if that holds up, the consumer stays okay, Main right. Street remains okay, Wall Street opens up with the return of capital markets, 
that'll only mean continued good news for the big banks going ahead. You're going to be out at the U.S. Open, tennis open here. There's like the Grey Goose Pavilion or whatever it is, Shreeholds Court there for like three weeks or whatever. Projected. It, it is. What's going to be the chit-chat at the Grey Goose Pavilion at the Open about what would Tom Montag do? Here's this force of nature. I've dealt with him at Davos, love him to death. What an interesting guy. Is he like, is this just like a moment or is this going to be a big deal where he steps in? He's a force of nature. We've obviously seen a lot of commentary around this. Uh, reality is at least based on our reporting and I know some other people disagree, but Goldman had been in conversation with Tom Montag for several months, months Who'd before been in the conversation. Is this Solomon dialing 1-800-SAVE-US? Uh, it's at least Solomon dialing 1-800-TOM-MONTAG. Uh, he's, he's in the past told me he's one of the greatest partners at Goldman Sachs. He's made an effort to court uh, Tom Montag over the past few years brought him back into the famous Goldman Sachs retired partners dinner, something that Montag had been avoiding for several years. Sure, uh, Bank of America, yeah. yeah and yeah, David yeah. Solomon certainly brought him back into the yeah. fold. And in the last several months, he's led yeah. the effort to bring him onto the board. And remember, he is a big, prominent voice when it comes to yeah. risk expertise, and that is still a big engine at Goldman Sachs. Sri Natarajan, thank you so much. Look for Bloomberg Reports with Sri Natarajan here on Goldman Sachs and on the rest of the banking uh, season as well. My basic take on this, Lisa, and it goes back to David Vinier and the crisis of 07, 08, 09, is this time is different. But the difference is that chart I mentioned earlier of the shocking 07 to now outperformance of J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs, frankly, doing very well. I think it's completely underplayed their outperformance of Morgan Stanley looking back 16 uh, years. I don't think that's in the zeitgeist right now. When people are talking doom and gloom about Goldman Sachs, they are talking about the recent missteps with Marcus and underperformance <clears throat> on the margins with respect to Morgan Stanley. Longer term, you're absolutely right. Yeah, but going right. forward, where is the growth model? And that continues to be the question at a time when they're very still, they're still very much an investment banking firm. They're talking about asset management. Everybody wants that golden goose. Can they get that market share? compared to Morgan Stanley that's made all these acquisitions, E-Trade, uh, as well as their massive wealth management business. A little bit of a bid to the screen here. Futures up three. NASDAQ futures up three-tenths of a percent. It'll be interesting to see uh, what happens there. To drive forward the political discussion, the new so with Washington waking up here at 8.56 Wall Street time, the gentleman from New Jersey, Christopher Christie with Anne-Marie Horton, Joe Matthew, balance of power this evening timely, to say the least. Stay with us on radio and television. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.